I'm not going to take long on this one, but thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on this webinar. And I just wanted to take the first few minutes uh, to dedicate the work that we have done uh, since Monday to that wonderful, amazing man on the screen, Mr. Derek Thompson. Um, Derek uh, had started off in 1975 as an electrical apprentice with Blackbourne Electrical in Antrim in Northern Ireland, where my family are from. He worked his way up from apprentice to managing director. Um, he was the Northern Ireland chair of the ECA, Electrical Contract Association. He then uh, joined uh, Electrical Training Trust, who's the chief exec, and obviously created Spark Safe License to Practice in 2016. And I think it's fair to say that if it wasn't for him, and I'm not trying to get emotional, if it wasn't for him, E5 and us as human beings on the screen would not be as finely tuned as we are. And everything that I try and do, that man is in the back of my head whispering, even though he's not no longer with us. Um, for those who don't know him, please research him because that man did more for this industry than most. So uh, it is with gratitude and humility. Thank you, Derek. You will never be forgotten. OK, everybody, let's get on with Amendment 2. So big brown book. Um, let's get started. So the journey continues, everybody. Um, obviously, the book was issued on Monday um, and it can be implemented immediately, although good luck, because there's a hell of a lot of reading to implement that immediately. Um, and I have clarified with the IET on Tuesday, we, there was a bit of confusion as to when it was withdrawn. Uh, it will be withdrawn on the 27th of September, so effectively in six months, any support for Amendment 1. So in six months time, hopefully we'll all be complying. But remember, excuse me, it's a guidance book. It's not statutory law. It can just be used in a court to demonstrate compliance with a law. You can still depart. And that's really important because our industry has a lot of people rowing and arguing about trying to comply with the book. And even at Alex yesterday, the IET made the statement of you work from the intent of this minimum standard. So even the IET said, not just us. Right, John, before we get into the meat of it, should we talk about how this book has grown and the number of them? Because we do get a lot of complaints. Yeah, there's the usual thing about, oh, there's a new book coming out every year and it costs so too much money and all that. And they do cost quite a lot of money. But that's nothing new because the uh, new version has been coming out pretty much forever. On the screen here, we've got some of the uh, old ones there from the 1950s and 60s. And if you're actually around in the 1960s, you'd have to buy, I think it was about seven different versions in that one decade. So this idea of them coming out all the time, not new. And as you can see there, they get bigger and bigger as time goes on. And the 18th, uh, obviously here, is now well over 600 pages. So it's just a continuation of a theme. Everyone likes to complain about it, but uh, it's, it's been going on for pretty much uh, forever. And now we're say up to uh, 600 pages plus of A4 size. So Yeah, uh, I believe yeah. the 15th edition, John, there was 11 printed editions of the 15th alone in a decade. Yep. yep. So, so uh, if you want to complain, go back there to the 1980s and uh, complain there. So. <laughs> yeah. So as you can see, it's obviously grown and grown and grown as, as technology and international harmonization has grown so that we could be safe globally, which I don't think anyone will argue. We used to when Senelec harmonization and we changed our cable colors, but there's some real common sense if you look into this. Um, so yeah, we've gone up by 58 pages. Um, we're now introducing a new part, but let's crack on. So for those learning, um, when you're in college, you will learn or you have learned when you were, you know, when I was a learner, there were seven parts. Your introduction, your fundamental principles, your definitions, all those big words, your assessment of characteristics, which never really changes that much. And then how do you protect for safety? How do you select and erect? How do you inspect and test? Is there any special occasions? It's, it's amazing the way the book is formatted and it's really handy to learn those parts. We obviously now, uh, we did a year ago, a draft of public comment review. There's been quite a lot of changes. So this is gonna be a bit of a whistle stop tour through as many of the changes as we can fit. But there is a new part called functional requirements. It was gonna be called energy efficiency at one point, I think in a DPC, but... Mm. We kind of lost that on the 18th edition when there was going to be a party and everybody complained and now it's probably going to cost us more money. So, hey ho. 
Um, now, I call this the Paul Skirm page. <laughs> Mr. Skirm, please introduce this requirement. Yeah, I suppose you could you could say this page has got my DNA all over it. Go on then, right. tell us. So we have certain words that are used. And when we see the word shall, it is a requirement. It means it's normative. It means you must do this to comply with the standard. Uh, all the others are informative, as you can see from the table, right? So um, the words they use are specific and common to all the standards. Whatever standard you look at, the words will be the same. And it's kind of a, a should. It's just a recommendation. You know, you'd have to kind of get away with, uh, or you'd have to try and explain your way out of not doing it. Um, permission as well. You know, you can do it if you want to, I suppose, in a way. Um, possibility, capability, can. In other words, uh, if you can do it, you should. Uh, but there are certain situations where you can't. Um, you might want to think about doing it this way, you know, as a, as a, there are other options, but this is one that we would sort of uh, maybe suggest to you. Um, and then obviously just a description is, just this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's fair to say. And I think it's, this is all part of standardization globally yeah. as well, yeah, 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 which yeah. is good because it means that in the future we can go abroad and people won't think we're talking, you know, mumbo jumbo. It'll be a, standard terminology that we use so i don't see this as a bad thing in fact i think this is a brilliant addition to the wine regs oh absolutely absolutely right let's get into part one so first thing and we'll whistle we'll go through these at, at, at pace first thing that the scope adds which is in part four prosumers low voltage electrical installation or pei including those located to electrical buildings so we'll, we'll define pei a little bit later on in part eight but that is a new addition to what the scope of 7671 includes houses, commercial, industrial, etc. There is a list in 11012. And then obviously there's one that has exclusions from scope. So that's again right at the start of the book. John? Yep, this scope uh, now covers, as got in yellow, the uh, installation support of fiber optic cables. So this covers data and all that kind of stuff. Previously that wasn't included, but it now is. Some people might have argued that fiber optics aren't electrical because they're not made of copper, but nevertheless, they're now included. So any communications cabling, including fiber optic, is now in scope. And that applies to uh, securing it properly for premature collapse and all of that. So uh, no more slinging it over the top of the suspended ceiling and just using the ceiling to hold it up there. Which makes fire engineers very happy, doesn't it, Dan? It does. <laughs> so all cables. One quick comment is that it, you know it seemed that people always ignored the fact that not people certain sectors of the industry ignored the fact that information and communication technology cabling copper cat five cat six um, coax uh, foam wires those were, always have been included always have been included yeah. yeah ELV has always been part of it we've just not really been good, very good at interpreting it big book. Right, moving on. Um, this one, very quickly, as Paul has already told me, um, this was a minor error, but we thought we'd include it for those who do ATEX. Um, it recognises explosive atmosphere standard series. So 60, um, 60079, it used to be just 60779, but they recognise it's a series because it was a minor error that's been fixed. So for those who do ATEX, feel warm and cuddly. It's now uh, recognising the huge volume of standards for dust and gas and various other petrochem and industrial installations. Now, this is one that was quite funny on Tuesday. Exclusions from scope 110.2, systems for distribution of electricity to the public, which is really interesting. So DNO equipment has always been out of scope. Why we do air flute impedance testing is a debate, but they've also added this other than prosumers installation, John. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, this, um, this is mainly going to cover things where you're generating stuff in your property and you're sending it back into the grid. So that is now in scope and it all fits in with the new uh, chapter 82 as we've got there. So all the DNA stuff's still out, but anything within your property that's generating or going to send stuff back out to the rest of the system is included yeah. as you would expect it to be. So don't be fooled because it's called exclusions. It's actually telling you that's included. So they've been very clear in their guidance there, which is a good thing. Um, which does mean, though, if you're doing EICRs, some of our ones from our DNO webinar there, um, are we coding any of that anymore? Or maybe there's a new code that we can talk about. And we'll talk about that in inspection and testing. But um, my advice will come later, as I'm sure we'll all agree. Um, 
another thing that we wanted to include in there is if, if you're of a certain age, like myself and Paul and John and Dan, uh, we grew up on the term direct and indirect shock, 16th edition and beyond term. It was very self-explanatory. Um, it's now been fully deleted and it's now basic and full. And one of the comments that um, Mr. Watts made in our last one was um, there's a lot of terminology that has been divorced or retired from the regulations. Um, and I genuinely, I'm going to say this now, I think the Brown Book is a massive improvement, give or take one or two issues, um, from the blue one. So I think they've made some huge steps, um, which is a good thing. But they had, I was it, 1,300 comments uh, lobbied, uh, which was great. The NIC declared 1,300 comments, which well done, everybody, because we've got a better book for it. So keep it up every time there's an amendment. Um, one of the other bits, John, 120.1, the existing book. Yeah, it's uh, basically gone from the rules to the requirements, which uh, it's yeah. a minor change in a word, but it makes quite a big difference in terms of <laughs> it does, what it actually but also, means. Also, John, what they've done is they've removed the term this standard. They now refer to the standard as the standard number. So it's harmonised across the document. Again, better use of language referring to itself in the new in the number, I think, is just a I know it's I know you know you won't get this probably from me sharing I see but these little things just make a difference and they're worth noting um moving on to part two uh, there are new definitions introduced and they align with IEC 650 IEC standards if you've watched any of our podcasts International Electrotechnical Commit Commission Committee um and they have a huge vocabulary which I actually downloaded a document today that went back to 1875 on harmonized language um so yeah, harmonised language is a good thing uh, across the globe. So some of the new terms that have been introduced, and there was an error in Tuesday, so I apologise on, on, on that. Um, the Foundation Earth Electrode was left in from our draft. It was It's not in the definitions, but some of the new terms, emergency switching off, generating set, protected escape route switch. And there's also some others, John. Where do these come from? Yep, these are all brand new, or at least brand new to this uh, standard. And these will fit in with part eight. That's what's to do with prosumers electrical installations, and that is one of the terms. And the previous thing where they got all those definitions from that standard, you can actually get those for free. There was a nice website which has all the definitions on it, which you can find in the chat window. Oh, so, that uh, was Electropedia, wasn't Electropedia. it? Yep, yeah. that is the one. Something so have a look, free, don't have to pay for it, accessible anywhere. So well worth a look. Um, so AFDD. It's a very interesting definition in the book as well. First time it's been clearly defined. I think it's a good one. I'm not going to repeat it here because we're, we're rolling through. Um, this is one of my favourites. I raised it on the draft for public comment as to what this means. So in the blue book, a consumer unit was a particular type of distribution board compromising a type tested coordinated assembly for control and distribution of energy, principally in domestic premises, incorporating manual means of double pole isolation in the incoming an assembly of one or more fuses, circuit breakers, residual current operating devices, or signaling and other devices that are proven during type test of the assembly and are suitable for it. That's what it used to be. It's changed. Now, whether there's an intent behind this or not, but it's now a particular type of distribution board intended for operation by ordinary persons, which an ordinary person can reset a breaker or an RCD, compromising again, type tested, coordinated assembly for control and distribution of energy, fine, incorporate manual means of double pole, absolutely on the incoming, and an assembly of one or more protective devices, signaling or other devices proven during type testing again, and as suitable as used. So, John, I said this to you on, on Tuesday, does this mean the death of fuses? Because fuses well, are mentioned. Yeah, they're not there. I mean, a fuse is a protective device, but the fact that they've just taken away fuses, but what if I take out now? a Busman fuse and put in an, a different manufacturer's yeah. fuse? You know, that is that a coordinated assembly anymore? So yeah, um, yeah, it's not. So if you take if you change a bit of it, then by this, it's not a consumer in it anymore. And it's really Just important, Mr. Skirm will say something here. I can tell you. Yeah, 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 yeah. This this ordinary person's thing ties into um, six one four three nine part three because that is where. Um, Consuming is for ordinary persons are defined. Uh, but I don't believe the fuse that goes in the fuse carrier is specified in that standard. The 
the the the, the fuse carrier itself will be, but I don't think the fuse itself within the carrier, but certainly circuit breakers is you know is a no no has been that well it always has been a no no. Yeah, that's fine. Um, just just because I've had a quick look at the screen um, on page two, there is a a, um, a indemnity from the authors saying that we don't take responsibility for the accuracy of this book, which is why we we've always said this is a minimum standard. Use your engineering judgment and application of other knowledge, which we'll get to at the end. So please stay with us. Uh, another term that's been introduced, DSO. Now, if you've listened to anything you've said, we've been bleating on about this for years, haven't we, John? Um, and it's fine yeah. to find in here. Yeah, it is in now. And it's, as I said, a party operating and distribution system. This is kind of a replacement for the old DNO, although it's not mm -hmm. quite a replacement. It's sort of all part of the same thing. Basically, just to recognise that it's not just a little old distribution network that we've got here. I mean, this is your old type thing. So you've got your basically big old coal power station, transmission around the country, a bit of local distribution that goes into your customer, it's in your house or your business or whatever. And that's pretty much the old ways or the old world. These ones are been uh, provided. We can actually get to these at the end. But uh, mm -hmm. this is the new world. And although it says new, what it actually means is what we're doing actually right now. So you've got the large scale generation still, although it's now different types. So you've got wind and solar and obviously various other things as well. You've got storage in the form of batteries, still got the transmission and distribution, but you've also got solar and wind and other things at the local level. And of course, you've also got smart houses and connected stuff and obviously the prosumers, electrical stuff as well, electric vehicles and all this kind of stuff all fitting together. And the main point here is that it's not just the flow of energy from the one end to the other, it goes in both directions now. So now it is massively more complex. And so this is already happening. So this isn't some future thing that's going to occur in a few years. We've already got all of this. And we, we just to add to that, we got to thank UKPN because they asked us to, and there is a report at the end we'll give you the link to. So please stay to the end because there's some information we're going to give you. But this is courtesy of UKPN, and I think it's one of the best visuals to, for layman's like me, I like pictures. And this is a great picture, which is why we put it on Instagram after the webinar, um, because you can talk round pictures. Um, moving on to part three. Now, Dave's going to do part three. So here we go. Thanks, Dave. There we go. So that's it. Part three, some minor, minor spelling bits and bobs, nothing to report. Part four. This is where we now get into protection for safety. And there are changes and some big changes as some of you who have maybe seen this before will know. Um, Form 11312 just rolls off the tongue really, doesn't it? This is the old regulation for bonding. And it's saying in each installation, you will bond metal water, metal gas, other systems, central heating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, great example there of a, a plastic pipe with a bond on it. And of course, we used to coin the to bond or not to bond or the names bond, pointless bond uh, comments. Another example there. Do you bond it? Looks like an MDP poly pipe. It's a good question. But going back, the name's bond. Um, it's been reworded for 11312. In each consumer's installation, I've highlighted in yellow the key words that are really important to, to look at. In each consumer's installation within a building, extraneous conductive parts liable to introduce a dangerous potential difference shall be connected. It's the exact same from there on, apart from when we get to the bottom of the regulation where it talks about incoming telecom providers like BT or Virgin, having if they have an extraneous part that does need to be bonded, as Paul told me the other day on my DNO cable, um, if they don't grant consent to bond that, and as a consequence, you can't meet the requirement then you must record it on the certificate. And one thing that 7671 does really well now, it asks you cons to consistently record any existing defects or departures. So there's more emphasis in leaving a good paper trail. Um, Mr. Skirm, what's your view on dangerous potential differences? Well, that's mainly, we're looking at where you've got um, pipe work, obviously, in the earth, and then you have a fault in the uh, in the installation. It's, it's keeping those differences between the extraneous parts and the and the the, the parts which have under or have a current phone under fault conditions to a, a minimum difference, potential difference, voltage between them. You know, it's equalizing the voltage across them all. Um, Sorry, you got a main plank. <laughs> Sorry, don't worry. Um, it's, it's interesting that um, one of the things that I gauged from this was 
we can always get potential differences, mm. but there may be four or five volts. Now that may be normal yeah. uh, installation behaviors from leakage, et cetera. But when it goes to danger, that's a slightly yeah. more, more, I think that requires more thought. Yeah, well, tra traditionally, I think over 50 volts would cast as dangerous, didn't we? Yep. So um, hence the, the equations in the book for the 50 volt uh, situation. Indeed. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking at minimizing, uh, minimizing that, but like to introduce a dangerous potential difference. Hmm. I, I well, literally, Paul, I think it's just think about this more. Think about the earthing more. Mm. And we'll get on to that. Mm. Um, but before we do, one of the things I want to raise as an issue now, people will shoot me down and that's fine. But one of the things we look at a poly pipe like you saw in the picture, and one of the things you can easily do Google, is look at MLCP pipe. It has an aluminium reinforced core. Now, worst case scenario, could, if installed incorrectly, could that conduct? So maybe we might want to have a little bit of think about these plastic stuff and do they actually still bring in, are they still extraneous? Can they bring in hazardous uh, faults if they're wrongly installed or buried in the ground? So a little bit of thought. It may be plastic, but inside it may be also conductive. So just wanted to raise that. Uh, moving on, additional requirements for socket outlets for mobile equipment. John. Yeah, I mean, RCDs have been pretty much required on a lot of stuff anyhow, but uh, we've now got in the yellow parts there. So RCDs up to, or not exceeding 30 milliamps, will be provided for socket outlets, um, not exceeding 30 amps in locations where the lab would be used by persons of capability BA1, BA3 or children, which is BA1, sorry, BA2 and BA3, and also mobile equipment with rated current not exceeding 30 amps to use outdoors. And then note one, for the purpose of the exception, an ordinary person instructed in the use of installation does not become an instructed person electrically or cease to be an ordinary person. So if you want to know what BA1, 2 and 3 are, we've got this on the next page, and it basically means everybody, effectively, unless they're instructed or skilled. So, yeah, BA3 has gone from handicapped to disabled, um, was a bit politically incorrect. And I think what they're basically trying to say there is, is you can't just tell someone be wary and don't plug something in because you don't have control over the utilisation of the installation. And there is most certainly more a push when we get onto the risk assessment to ensure that areas where children or vulnerable people, everything is uh, RCD protected because in the 18th tradition it went up to 32 amp. Now it's effectively blanket RCD, which we'll get on to. Before we do, this is the sneakiest edition in the book. Um, so those in the picture who don't know that is a conjure disc um, from Earthing Services because it's a lot safer than a rod. That's why I put it in there. Um, and in the regulation, it's a new reg. It says it is recommended that an additional connection to Earth by means of an Earth electrode in accordance with Chapter 54 is made to the main Earthing terminal. This recommendation does not apply to outbuildings or dwellings served by the installation. Uh, I'm going to start with John. What are your thoughts on that one? Yeah. Now, just to be clear here, we're talking about TN systems here. We're not talking about TT. So the presence of earth electrodes does not mean TT. This is TN CS most of the time, or TNS if you've got one of those rare items like that. Um, this is basically putting it in so that if you have a fault in the network, as in your combined neutral earth connector is broken, these electrodes will keep the voltage on exposed parts down to hopefully a sensible level and it's recommended now it doesn't say you will must have it put in but ultimately that's where it's going and that's where it's going to lead probably in a very short time um good idea i think i mean the rest of the world has been doing this pretty much forever so this is not desperately new in that regard it's sort of new here but it's something we probably should have been doing quite some time ago so I think this is a good idea. However, and I spoke to the IET about this the other day and, and they actually agreed with me. Um, one of the things that putting a local electrode can do, and you're right, it's done around the world. By putting a local earth electrode, what you can do is mask potentially a broken pen mm. on your network. And that's one of the biggest hazards of this. I genuinely think this is inevitable. I don't think all the solutions are there yet. Um, and I've told you guys years ago in the podcast that when I do my driveway, it's all getting reinforced and it's all going to be tied into an earth anyway. So I think for prosumering, you're going to need this as well. So this is the recommended before 10 years time, it becomes a shell. I think this is inevitable. What do you think, I think Paul? it's going to be very difficult to do all retrospectively on installations, even rewires. Yeah. You know, um, no, sorry, let me rephrase that to make it mandatory on every installation, including rewires. I think it should be made mandatory on new builds. And 
uh, you know, new constructions, and then hopefully eventually it will roll out. But I mean, the whole point of it though is to neg- is, is to mitigate the, the broken pen. Well, really. So just on that, so in the 18th edition DPC for Amendment Two, it was the foundation earth electrodes were recommended, and then they were taken out, and this has managed to be slipped in. So this is quite a sneaky one because I don't think I've not seen or anyone talking about this yet. So again, it's recommended. Would I put it retrospectively? Nope. New build. Yeah, I'll think about it because in theory, the um, the concentric cable and everything else should have a decent life. It's probably the same as the earth electrode. So yeah, I'd put it on new build. Existing, very difficult. Don't even get me started on flats. Mm. Right. AFDDs, 41117, protection against electric shock. Um, this was the existing regulation that caused carnage and rows and just quite a very horrible atmosphere, to be honest with you, because it gave examples of where you um, it was recommended to install an AFDD, premises of sleeping accommodation, everywhere I lay my head, uh, locations with a risk of fire due to nature and material, I quite like that, woodworking shops, storage combustible, I like that. Um, fire propagating structures, yep, common sense, and locations of endangering or irreplaceable goods museums. I had no issue with that. The trouble is, is there needed to be more guidance. So, John, do you want to tell us about AFDDs and then take us through the new rig? Yeah, AFDDs, uh, as you probably heard about already, basically they're electronic devices which uh, monitor what's going on in a circuit, looking for two types of faults. On the left there, we've got a parallel arc fault which is between two conductors line and neutral in this case and then on the other side there on the right we've got a series arc fault which is where a single conductor becomes damaged or broken and you get arcing between the two ends of it series arcs are more common but they can both lead to fire and damage what happens with previous insulation is you get a small current flowing between them that damages the insulation causes it to become more conductive which then increases the current and then that causes more damage and Obviously, that just repeats and continues until fire occurs. AFDDs are designed to identify this before it gets to the stage of fire and flames and disconnect and avoid the uh, place burning down. And it can occur anywhere in the installation. It can. And uh, damaged flexors, as we've got there, and that's uh, some kind of washing machine or something, which uh, obviously yeah. suffered a fair bit of damage. Now, as we said previously in the webinar, there was a very good uh, um, a, a presentation by the Electrical Contractors Association, um, Shahid, their technical manager, and he made a very good point about um, you can mitigate the need for these by using um, LSOH cabling, which you wouldn't then need um, because LSOH doesn't create that carbon deposit to cause the tracking and the arcing. However, you still got to consider the fixed loads. One other thing about BSEN 62606, um, it was written by a committee which is made up of white goods manufacturers, and it's evidently cheaper to put it in the board than in all the white goods devices. So again, another solution for other people's problems. Definitely a solution for other people's problems. Yes. Right, John, tell us about this new reg, and then Dan will chip in. Right, this is the new one, as in the brown book down the side over there. So Art Fault Detection Devices, or AFDDs, conforming to BSEN 62606, shall be provided, so in other words you will be putting them in, for single phase AC final circuits supplying socket outlets with rated current not exceeding 30 amps in, high risk residential buildings, houses in multiple occupation, occupation, purpose built student accommodation and care homes. So in all of those they are now required and uh, you will be putting them in. High risk residential buildings is assumed to be buildings over 18 metres in height at the moment, but as the note there says that may change over time and various other things should do. So current legislation should be applied. So common sense in a certain way, but uh, at the moment it's over six storeys high because apparently if they're seven storeys high, they could be much more dangerous than if they were five. If that I makes any I sense. The <laughs> note on current legislation, um, the, the, the note there is because fire safety legislation is changing as we speak. Uh, mm. And it's going to be, you know, it's, it's very quick the way it's moving. Um, so the focus is on the HIRBs. Um, so the one here for me, looking at that, the, the the HMOs, that's quite big because when you when you define what an HMO is, you have to understand where you're putting that. What is an HMO? Um, so, I mean, this is this is a good thing as long as the right device is is installed. 
Some somebody said to me the other day, Dan, a HMO to them was loads of people living in the same house. <laughs> Which I thought, okay, interesting. But well, I don't think that's what it is. It's more like houses converted to flats, etc. Yeah, exactly. Ex- ex- headsets, mm-hmm. headsets, and stuff like that, isn't it? It is. Right. So there's another bit to this regulation, Mr. Yep. JW. So- uh, so for all other premises, so in other words, not any of those things, the use of AFTDs is recommended for single phase AC circuits by socket outlets like seeing 32 amps. So that's an extension of what we had previously because it's not in that set of listed items. It's now anywhere else. And where used, they'll be placed at the origin of the circuit to be protected, so in the consumer unit. And uh, the use of AFTDs does not obviate the need to apply one or more measures provided in other clauses. So they're not a one thing fixes all solution and then for some reason for bus bar and power track systems the afd may be placed at a location other than the origin of the circuit which presumably means whoever wrote it thought that bus bar systems never go wrong and go faulty and couldn't possibly arc or cause a fire mm. so uh, yes i have seen one blow up it, it nearly launched mm. itself through a a data room a data center room but never mind um well, rats yeah, never get in bus bar chambers one. do they and fray themselves across the bus bus mm. yes they do um, this to me is a sensible um, part now where people can look at them and apply that regulation sensibly. However, we've still got the debate. Selection and erection is really key of these devices. Remember, these things need to see a minimum level of energy flow to create that stable arc with the Siemens, Electrium, Wilex, Crabtree, etc. They claim up one and a half amps is sufficient for their device to work under the product standard 62606. They need two and a half amps. So the first decision making process I always do with AFDDs is, does a plumber touch it? (laughs) Showers, immersion heaters, boilers, high energy consuming stuff. I know it sounds dumb, but it's true. Does a plumber touch it? If it's my radial for my living room, I could tell you now it's about 500 watts because my telly uses about 82 watts. My Apple TV is about 60 watts. It's nothing. It's so low energy now. However, um, one member of E5 isn't here. It's Mr. Dempsey. And Mr. Dempsey has a really important view. So if you're watching, Ryan, we love you loads. Um, he made a point of if I was going in and I was selecting and erecting in a domestic home, doesn't matter where it is, flat house, whatever. And I walked in and there was an invalid who was bedridden. I would look at the utilization of that installation and I would put in AFDDs to protect that person. End of, because that's common sense. Like Mr. Scum who should have AFDDs in his fuse board. Um, we're probably going to have got. to change <laughs> well, We're going to have to come around and change the fuse board. Um, but yeah, moving on, on to what I call um, 422, which has been rewritten, redrafted. Now, we had some feedback on this um, using Grenfell. Well, OK, we did, we're not going to use Grenfell, although it's still on the screen. We're going to look at Harrow Court, which is on the top left, which is a fire, 2nd of February 2005. And that was um, two firemen died because plastic uh, fixings into the into the wall we're also going to look at shirley towers where again plastic trunking collapsed wrapped themselves around the firemen two firemen died i do not tolerate bad behaviors and when it comes to fire rated fixings it's a moral and ethical um, decision making process i am disgusted that our industry has argued since the 17th edition over fire rated fixings this shouldn't even be a debate people have died because of this stuff so 422 has been redrafted but before we do i want to show you because you can Google this, and this is from Shirley Towers. And those that image there, the wires, is a 3D simulation based on the images of the wires that collapsed in the escape route, which Dan will talk about in a minute. Fire rate fixings, guys and girls. Seriously, if you're arguing over the cost, you're doing something massively wrong. Um, so, yeah, that's just an image I wanted to make a more robust uh, uh, debate before we get into it. These are images where the fireman died. As you can see, you walk out your flat, that whole top half is probably filled with smoke. Um, As you can see, the line of smoke damage on the left there, Dan. Um, So that emergency lighting would be terrible, which is why Dan's a great um, recommender of low level photoluminescent um, uh, guidance strips, which I've actually bought into as well. And so the regulations now, this is a huge section uh, and it also introduces an Appendix 11. But Dan, do you want to just go through this one, mate? Yeah, so um, to be honest, a lot of this, I think it's already been in there. It's just been rejuggled around a little bit with an appendix at the end. Um, so, um, yeah, what we're, what we're saying here is, is a lot about um, external influences. So um, 522.1, 
if I just read the second paragraph, for such in, uh, locations, the fire safety design of the building should be documented. This information should be included in the fire safety manual produced by the person, responsible persons. So what they're expecting you to do is um, when you're doing your design installation is asking the client about the fire safety design of the building. Um, you should have done that beforehand, to be honest. Um, and it, there was it was worded in a certain way. But the slight problem, what me and Paul discussed earlier, is that um, quite often in existing buildings, we don't have this information. Yeah, we don't. And this is the thing for electricians now. So this, we're not going to read out all these regulation numbers. What we're going to do is you can see on the screen, BS9999 at the top right, that's the commercial industrial application. BS9991 is your domestic. However, as Dan rightly put me right, part B. That's where you start on that fire engineering journey. Part B of the building rigs, then you pick 9999 or 9991. And if that doesn't solve your problems, you go to 7974, which is a risk-based approach. So there's, there's lots of ways of modeling, but for existing buildings, how do electricians get this right? Well, one, have a conscience. If you see something, flag it, get some fire rate fixings. I'm not telling you to bankrupt yourself doing it, but make sure it's safer. If you see problems and you go up to a landlord, and I had a guy this morning on Instagram message me, and he said, uh, I've got a problem. It was a premature collapse issue. And I said, well, go to the BNO. And he said, well, the BNO, building network operator, um, the BNO was the, um, uh, what do you call them, the estate agent for a flat. So they have no competency or fire files or electrical files or anything else. So the, the DNO walked away from him on a, on a collapse issue. And it just, he was like, what do I do? And I was like, well, if I was you, I'd probably issue a danger notification. Um, because the landlord doesn't have their own knowledge, which makes them dangerous, and you have to ensure you protect yourself. So this 421, it talks about recommendations for electrical system designers and installers to provide people with details of the electrical system. We should be doing that anyway. Setting out the basis in respects to fire safety, compartmentation is key, not pink foam. If you're using pink foam. Yeah, and, and, and this is the thing again, um, you as the electrician, it's not your um, role or duty to understand what the fire performance of a wall that you're penetrating is. It's it's the the client um, now. Okay, my you know domestic a single dwelling is a little bit different to a commercial building, but the principle still applies that if you are penetrating a wall that has a fire performance and the design is um, it, it feeds into how the fire safety measures are set out and. Um, I would be writing personally to the client asking for the information because it's not as simple as it may seem. And if there's been building modifications to the fire safety, you might be penetrating a wall that's not obvious that it's a fire compartment wall. I mean, yeah. some things are clear, like if you've got a flat and you've got the common parts between the flat and the common parts and between the two flat or two flats, whatever, they are compartments. That's quite clear. But um, you should be asking the, the owner again. Now, this comes down to that uh, legal requirement to cooperate, coordinate and communicate. So if we're going into stuff that isn't just a domestic house and there's more than one family involved, you've got to put stuff in writing. You need to ask questions. You need to understand. Now, a lot of it will be existing. There'll be no knowledge. That's an opportunity for the contractor to make money. So if you diversify your skill set, because most electricians, um, I think the IET said in their webinar, we're not required to be fire engineers. Well, we are the one trade that goes everywhere and engages with everyone because everybody uses what we provide, which is energy and electricity. So to say that we don't think about stuff is wrong. We need to, because look how diverse and look how many special occasions are. Look at all the new technologies. Do we do we specialize or do we generalize? And but even still, I wouldn't fix something to a wall where I knew the wall was gonna collapse. I wouldn't drill for a wall if I knew that a bit of pink foam and it was a two hour fire rated room. I wouldn't do that. So one of the things that's really interesting in this new rewrite is where is determined cable should have an improved fire performance, but not covered by rigs. It talks about a light transmittance of cables of 60%. Now on Tuesday, I didn't know what it was. Dan, do you want to tell us very succinctly what 60% light transmittance is? Yeah. I... Or do you want me to tell them? Because I remember what, exactly what you said. Well, go and tell me exactly. Okay. What... So basically what it is, is um, obscurement. There's a term called obscurement in the standard. And effectively what it is, is there's a test that is done on the cable where you effectively take a light, you have the cable in a box, you set fire to it, smoke will fill the box, you put a photocell the other side, and there shouldn't be more than 60% obscurement to the photocell. So what, what we're saying is if the cable burns, it's the smoke produced from the cable that obscures light. 
it's quite yeah. simple so and it's it's to do with um it's to do with fumes toxic fumes and also visibility because in an escape route we want it to be visible so we can actually escape that's the basic principle dan knows because dan works with me uh, on my little wonderful slice of the world we use fire rated cables for everything we don't use twin and earths and everything has proper solid uh, designed tested fixings for premature collapse we probably go overkill but i would rather be overkill and keep people safe there was ever an incident so um for me this is a really good section um because it does introduce something called protected escape routes um now it says in there cables or other electrical equipment shall not be installed in a protected escape route unless they're part of it so essential fire safety general needs lighting and emergency lighting or socket outlets for maintenance that's gonna be very difficult to retrospectively apply but god damn it highlight the risk and make things better than what you when you got there and there is a note that says guidance is provided in append, appendix 13 it's really good and there's another note that says generally this means cables and protected routes should be limited to lighting accessories emergency light fire detection alarm although cables for other safety systems may be necessary now a lot of them will be standard pvc armaments and you can flag to your client in writing we strongly recommend c3 it improvement recommended that these are xlp fp400s because there's nowhere else to put them um, potentially and then it may generate more work for you because mm -hmm. people want compliance the key phrase here also which i which i read through was uh, protected escape routes so there's if you read the um what you call it the, the at the beginning of the book um it, it's a route enclosed with specific fire resisting construction designated for escape to a place of safety in the event of an emergency so yeah, yeah. Um, it's a protected escape route. It's not an escape route. But they are different. Um, in, however, um, yeah. However, in in some, this is where it refers back to BS double nine double nine or double nine nine one because in some dwellings you might have protected escape so, routes. This is my view here, and it's only my opinion. I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to be responsible for anyone's death, whether they're a hardworking fireman or a member of the public. So my view is is everything that you install should be protected against premature collapse in the event of emergency regardless whether it's an escape route because let's be honest about it, on a railway station where we work everything's an escape route and it should be protected where reasonably practicable so that's what we are doing but but uh, paul, but paul the, the important thing here is in in a protected escape route you can only have cables that are part of a safety system yes that, that's so the, this is very difficult to apply on railways let's be perfect oh, frank here yeah, definitely, definitely. this is very difficult to apply um in tower blocks yes with some work but new build great retrospective opportunity for work so again just just finishing up this bit protected escape routes keep cables as short as possible there are cms requirements there's resistance to flame propagating cable requirement there's a requirement for mechanical protection and placing outreach which is very difficult on them escape routes and again reference to appendix 13 what this reads to me is don't be sticking plastic in. So as far as I'm concerned, this is the death of plastic trunking. Should have been killed off decades ago, but that's the industrial me talking there. Um, what do you think, John? He's on mute, which is unusual. Yeah, the um, point about this is that if you, if you put, it doesn't matter what the cables are, if you're gonna put plastic trunking in an escape route, any fire is gonna cause massive amounts of toxic smoke. So don't, you just can't use it and that's totally it. inappropriate yep we don't want smoke um period um moving on to 443 uh protection against overvolt which is of atmospheric origin so this was another one that caused carnage and lots of rows and and our wonderful friend sean asking a million questions about waveforms and and durations and how the devices work and if they're fused or spark gaps and oh this has caused a lot of debate um, as you can see, there's different types you can get for single or free phase. And in the old book, it had this chaos um, in Kana, and also in the DPC, it was even worse because it started with a note. But it said protection against over voltages shall be provided where the consequence cause could result to serious injury, loss of human life. That's pretty much everywhere. Result in interruption to public service or damage cultural hemorrhage. Again, most offices, workplaces, museums, etc. Result in operation to commercial activity, industrial activity, every workplace. And affect a large number of co-located individual every tower block and it was then there was this about risk assessment and crl and doing all the working out and we ended up with this crl uh, equals femv uh, divided by lp and then we had to work out lengths and it was just it was so much arguments and chaos but luckily thank god in the brown book 
it has been deleted, removed in its entirety. So in the brown book, we now have this. Um, protection against transient overvoltages shall be provided where the consequence cause could result in serious injury to or loss of life. Brilliant. Failure of a safety service as defined in part two or significant financial or data loss. Now, that to me is a lot more succinct. Probably could have a few more generalized comments, but safety service, smoke alarm, mains powered smoke alarm, uh, emergency lighting. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. So um, I just think you should just be installing it now. It then says for all other cases, protection against transient overvoltages shall be provided unless the owner of the installation declares it not to be required. Don't tell them, just do it. They're like 20 odd quid nowadays. However, if they don't want it, they have to accept the risk of damage. So how can a normal person understand the impact of that decision? Yeah, they can't. So I mean, if you're certainly for domestic, that cannot be used because there are no people that like living in a normal house that are going to understand what that thing is they're signing away. So certainly for domestic, just put the service protection in and be done with it. Don't even bother with that. Oh, it might not damage this. It could. Your TV is only worth fifty quid, and all this so, is nonsense. So. This is. I have. I have spent a lot of money on surge protection in the last few years because I had a number of fires. They've stopped because my surge protection has gone in, and they're doing their job. So SPDs are a given for me. They have been since this chaos came in. And to be honest with you, it was the worst worded um, set of regs that could ever because it put a lot of people off because they couldn't understand it. So it was just walk away from it because that's what you do. <coughs> understand a part of the regs you walk away from it moving on to part five john yeah part five now this is identification of the notices and uh five and four and three except there's no possibility of confusion unambiguous marking shall be provided that the interface between conductors identified in accordance with bs 7671 and conductors identified to previous versions of bs 7671 so this is the uh, old colours thing where you've got the previous colours and then the new colours. Although it doesn't have to be colours, you could, of course, use letters or numbers. And as it says there, there is an Appendix 11 to have a look at, which we'll... Uh, yeah, we'll have a look at that in a bit. Look at that later. Now, so, colours. Um, uh, a lot of these colours have changed, as we can see down the uh, list there. This is mainly for DC. You'll be glad to hear the AC hasn't actually changed. So... As you can see there, DC is now going to be red and white instead of brown and grey. And functional earths are now pink instead of cream. So Indeed. hopefully we don't change the phase colours anytime soon. Wink, wink. Anyway, let's move on. So one quick summary of all this, because it's a big, big chapter and a nice new appendix to read. With lots of good visual pictures. So there's some lessons learning here. So credit to the guys at the IET. They've done a good job on this. Uh, warning of voltage, there's a reg for that. Warning that live parts are not capable of being isolated by a single device, there's a reg for that. Periodic inspection and testing, periodic user testing of RCDs. Now, in Guys Note 3, it lists there's a requirement for periodic user testing label for AFDD. Uh, no, there isn't. There's no regulation for an AFDD label, but it still is in the inspection schedule. So you may consider that a minor discrepancy. Um, but yeah, so you can maybe there'll be a corrigendum soon. But Periodic inspection, um, earthing and bonding connections, we know BS951 clamps and labels, alternative supplies, presence of SPDs, high protective conductor currents, the presence of diagrams, instructions, and smaller information. However, in a domestic household, the periodic inspection, RCD test label, AFDD label, and the SPD label are exempt. Shall I carry this one? Yeah, yeah I'll carry this one on. Um, so a uh, basically 51491 says a diagram chart or table with information shall be provided, which is brilliant. And then it talks about the type of composition for each circuit, points of utilization, number, what we would consider a good old fashioned commercial industrial design, a good layout set of drawings, hopefully with elevation drawings so that we actually give the inf information electricians a chance to succeed. Um, it then says further down the regulations for simple installations, the foregoing information may be given in a schedule. So you go into your domestic, you've got your schedule, not your full diagrams. But then later on, and this is a new part of the regulation, it says the requirements of regulation need not be applied for domestic premises or similar, where certification for initial verification complies with the guidance for receipts in Appendix 6 has been issued to the person ordering the work. Now, this basically means uh, lots and lots of labels, but if you're in a household, don't really have to do. 
And also, if we go on just a little bit further, and I'm just going to mop this up if you don't mind, John, um, there is another harmonization step for diagrams, charts must comply with the suite of BSEN IEC standards. So we'll hopefully be harmonizing as we go forward, which is a lot better. They even define colors in the appendix for the background of labels. So if you make your labels via like Signs and Labels Direct, you might want to consult the labels. And if you're making your own color labels, you'll be departing technically. Um, whether you note that down as a departure is down to you. Um, our favorite regulation, our favorite label of all time, which has been brutally abused, has now been deleted. Gone. No more dual color labels, which is ironic, John, because the first regulation you quoted kind of inferred that you still had to do it. Yeah, so you still need the labeling, but you don't need a label to tell you about the labeling and the different colors. So it's not, let's not confuse everybody, but <laughs> it's confusing. Um, Appendix 11, everybody, is introduced. Now, with this lack of labeling in domestic, one of the people in the chat um, on Tuesday talked about having a QR code, um, which I did remember. There is actually a person who does QR codes and certification um, and a company called Certon. And there, if you scan your screen, it will take you to the website and you can log in and register and play around with it. And basically the principle of this was, and this is this is not new tech, this is old tech. Um, you just put it on the board, you go up and scan it and you can access the documents for the electrical installation. So I'm gonna challenge uh, the chaps at Certon um, to ensure that their system has all the requirements of labeling and all the necessary warnings and provisions accordingly. Um, Again, so there you go. So scan the screen, that QR does work. I checked it earlier on. Should we move on to types of RCDs, John? Yeah, now RCDs, of course, are not particularly new, but uh, this bit is, and this is 53132, unwanted tripping, and residual and current products devices shall be selected and directed such as to limit the risk of unwanted tripping. The following shall be considered. Now, there's a whole list of these, but the important one that's been put in here is number two, the use of RCBOs for individual final circuits in domestic installations. So this is really the death of the uh, split load or twin RCD board, the uh, specials from the likes of certain DIY sheds. So RCBOs for everything, really, and uh, that will obviously avoid the issues of unwanted tripping, which is mainly due to leakage currents, which is covered in, say, parts three and so on there. So goodbye RCDs and goodbye cheapo boards and basically doing this it is an interesting one, John, first one, because that yellow line is the new introduction to the existing reg. But if you look at the notes, it talks about better selection based on the type of RCDs according to the circuit or the load. They have been warning us for a long time, which which kind of leads on to my favourite bit. Um, but before we do, we'll get into for those who are learning, um, there are different types of RCDs. So when you're in college and you're learning, you're told there is a type of breaker, B, C or D. And effectively, your B's are your domestic, your commercial is your C's and your industrial is your D. And that's all about inrush and capability to withstand fault currents and all that good stuff. So that's what we're taught. That's bread and butter basic principles. But there's also another type of device and it's the same type, but for RCDs. And we have had for many years type AC type A, type F and type B. You can get B plus as well, but there's only a standard in Germany, which we'll cover in our RCD webinar. Now AC um, is for standard, what we call linear loads or resistive loads or inductive loads, um, good old fashioned high current usage of equipment. And that's what they did. A type A offers a level of protection up to six milliamps and that's it. And that's what most people are fitting. Type F, slightly higher up to six, 10 milliamp with a connected frequency, which is why I recommended they go in kitchens. And then type B is again up to 10, uh, 10 milliamps, but it covers also immunity to every type of RC, um, DC, which could be batteries or switch mode power supplies or chopped or whatever. So they're the types of devices. B is prohibitively expensive and not really ready for the domestic market. And I've had many chats with my peers in the industry. And for me, I've got all type A RCBOs downstairs. However, if I could get a type F, I would put a type F for my kitchen equipment because we know that somebody on Instagram bought, I think it was at Instagram, a coffee machine from Italy, and it recommended a type, type F RCD, which are, again, prohibitively expensive. Now, John, tell me about why they're banned and what's banned. Yeah. What's banned in these countries and has been in most of those since the 1980s are type AC RCDs, which is the very same ones that you can still buy over here and 
some people are still installing today. And they're banned because they simply don't work very well or at all with any kind of modern equipment. So if you've got an electric heater with just a resistive element, yeah, that's fine. But what in the world today is one of those? I mean, 99% of stuff is stuck full of electronics and all kinds of other stuff and variable speed controllers and all the rest of it. So all of those countries there banned them long ago, but unfortunately we haven't until now, of course. No, and, and John, when were ACRCDs banned? Is this a recent thing or is this? Oh, 84 in Germany. I think it was so yeah hmm. nearly 40 years, years ago i was six years old okay yeah absolute nonsense and i remember so, them coming into the uk and our tutor saying these are supplementary protection what we would call maybe additional uh but they won't pick up they and of course now we've gone through that and um interestingly if anybody wants to know a little bit more about this chapter 33 that part that not we don't read much compatibility mr skern will tell you that we need to think more about the interfaces and the connected loads it's not just connect a load resistor it pulls energy this thing can produce and back feed so there is a compatibility with electronics and electronics henceforth we did our demonstration rigs years ago and went around the colleges talking about this so please be mindful austria belgium Germ uh, germany denmark switzerland clever people um, we are phasing them out. Why we're phasing them out? Probably just get rid of stocks. Uh, this is where I don't like manufacturer influence very much, but, and I wish our industry had a, a bit more stout to just blanket ban them, but they are banned. Now, John, do you want to cover this one? Yeah, this is the uh, new bit. So RCS type AC shall only be used to serve fixed equipment where it is known that the low current contains no DC components. And the examples there would be a electric heating appliances or simple filament lighting, neither containing electronic components. So pretty much nothing, because who uses incandescent lamps anymore? Well, nobody, it's all LED, and LEDs are not resistive loads. And electric heating appliances, well, you might have an immersion heater perhaps, but uh, that's pretty much it. So type AC is going away. You can't use it for pretty much anything anymore. So it's going to be type A or above as standard and a couple of other notes there there is a uh, technical report there which uh, covers things and some typical fault currents for circuits are included in annex a53 and that's actually been in there for quite some time so uh, Indeed. so look at that just on this um the, somebody mentioned in the comments about coding i have been c2ing this for years dan knows this dave knows this paul knows this because if you have information from the manufacturer, we are required to consider manufacturer instructions. Let me give you a whistle stop tour of what we've just explained. So uh, published document IEC technical report 62350. So this is it. Uh, you don't need to buy it. You can actually, uh, you can see it right there. So it's guidance for the correct use of RCDs for households. Within there, there is a, uh, a list which gives you some generic values of uh, leakage from equipment. And if we say computers, I have 10 computers um, and I take the sum of connected appliances times 0.75. So let's say I've got 10 computers, 25, uh, 20 milliamps times that by 0.75, that's my leakage. That's how I choose my RCD based on the 30% rule. So when people go, oh, how do we make sure that we don't have you know, a nuisance tripping? Well, this is where you look at the connected equipment, you find out the leakage. And by the way, this is, go, this is in the Irish regs. There's a requirement to know the connected loads and the leakage now. So this is coming, just being more and more reinforced so that you think about what the connected load is, otherwise you're going to get nuisance tripping. So, you know, milliamp, uh, if we go with a 10% rule, I can have nine printers on a radial. That's it. After then, I run the risk. Well, actually, no, times 0.75, I can have probably 10 or 11, actually. So I can have about 10 or 11. After that, I run the risk of nuisance tripping. Do I comply? If it's more than that, no. However, I can still depart. This is just trying to get you to think about this compatibility issue and leakage current is key to it. Now, just to give you an example of, of configuration of RCDs, we didn't do this on Tuesday, but I thought it was important based on feedback. This is an example taken from EN European Norm 5178, and it's about the configuration of RCDs. So everyone says, oh, can I have a type AC feeding this, that, and the other? As you can see there, you've got an RCCB with a type A time delayed feeding two type A's, which feed various equipment. Um, if it's a type B, you can see there's a requirement for Henley blocks. That would be a type F as well, um, where it's separately fed. 
Now you can see there's a, a, a boiler that's connected onto a type A and it's indicating that's the wrong uh, protection measure. If we then look at the instructions from the manufacturer, and it's really important we do that, this is the instructions from the manufacturers. I have muted it to protect the manufacturer, but it says this blank has been factory tested as a unit ready for connection on an adequately sized power cable, excellent. This should be routed to the board, brilliant. It then says protected by a circuit breaker, depending on the nature of the grid, TT system or is required by a German standard. An RCD may be required. We recommend an ACDC sensitive class B. They're like huge, they're like four gangs wide. Um, and there are coffee machines that require type F because of the nature of the inverters. In fact, Baco washing machines, inverter driven. Look at the guidance. There's, there's been guidance out there since the 18th on what level of protection we have. Um, so I believe, and I'm sure Mr. Skirm will agree, we're probably not getting it right now. And I think if I can repeat what we said in a previous podcast, take your A's and your F's and throw them in the bin. Take A's, C's, A's and F's, chuck them in a bin, just concentrate on B's. If everybody concentrate on B's, the, the price would come down, the design would get smaller, they would be optimised and we wouldn't have a problem. However, Until we do, we'll have a problem. Just be mindful we can't bankrupt you. So this is more about verbal pressure to your wholesalers to produce and level up. And oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting Sparks go out and spend, um, you know, oh, 300 pounds, 400, 500, 600 pounds on RCDs and start fitting them willy-nilly. Um, I'm talking about pressurising the industry into... Yeah, if you did a 10-way board with RC, uh, type BRC BOs at the moment, you're looking at five grand <laughs> to buy the board. <laughs> um, yeah. We're going to move on. That was just to give you a little bit of things to think about and consider. The information is out there. We'll cover it at the end as to where to get it. Chapter 54, earthing and protective conductors. Again, that leakage element we were talking about, 30%. John, dual earth terminals. Yeah, dual earth terminals have been a thing for a very long time. And that went in with the uh, having that ring of protective conductors with their separate connections. So if one came out and fell apart, there was still a path back for all this high leakage equipment. However, that's all gone. And the reason it's gone is because on a 30 minute RCD, you can't have more than 9 million amps of leakage anyway. So these things, which were designed for 10 and above, of course, can't apply anymore. So it comes down to the design of the installation. If you've got a circuit that's got high leakage, well, it needs to be changed and probably cut up into smaller circuits. So requirement for dual terminals has gone and all the rest of the stuff that went with it gone as well. Whether they'll continue making them with the sockets with the twin on uh, isn't yet known. Yeah, they might. Just remember, but, folks, I, I think I would I hope they stay because I just think they're handy. Um, but remember, this is a minimum standard. You can still depart. You can still wire how you want as long as you can justify that your selection erection is uh, consistent for safety and also applying this retrospectively on the ICRs. We will do a webinar this year when Dave is better and we will do an EICR coding webinar to Amendment 2 and we'll have a bit of fun and games. Applying this to the new controversial sections, I think, is probably the, uh, the phrase we're going to use. But Dan, I couldn't not have you on and let you give the lecture on this slide because I'm so sick of industry bodies stating you cannot code fire alarms. Yeah, well, it, it's, I mean, yeah, it says it shall comply with the relevant parts of the BS series. So it, it, it's there. <laughs> yep. And when you go into that series, it then says comply with workmanship and installation practice 7671. You can code a fire alarm. And anyone in an entry body says that, give them my name and phone number. I want to have a chat with them because but I think those sorts what, of comments are silly. What I will say is that you've got to be really clear with your client about what's included in the, the extent and scope of your inspection and testing and what's not because again we don't want non-competent persons testing fire life safety systems who don't know what they're doing yeah no this is more aimed at the if you're if you're there and you're sticking your head above the ceiling and you see a fire alarm that isn't you can code it as potentially dangerous and you can maybe quote that regulation because it's a fire alarm system this is not to replace a full service and inspection of a safety system. This is to ensure that the safety system meets the requirements and good workmanship, best practices of the wiring rigs, fire rated fixings, et cetera, et cetera. As we all know, you look above the ceiling, it's lashes central, away you go. Not my problem, Gov. So and, and I wanted to have that debate. And the cabling systems as well, because in a lot of the um, other standards, like emergency lighting standards, um, it doesn't really focus on the wiring systems, whereas 7671 does. So there's, there's, you know, they point towards each other, mm. reference each other. 
Indeed. Right, we're moving on, if I can. Hang on, let's see if my computer works again. Back to normative references again, aren't we? Yeah. Indeed. Part six. This is this is uh, this was an interesting one at the IET's um, webinar, which is available on YouTube, by the way. It's very good. The guys put a lot of work into it. Uh, I watched it quite a few times while I was researching this on Monday. Um, now, there is no new test kit required, but there are some changes. And this is where, respectfully, I had a chat with the chaps at the IET on Monday, as did Paul, and I strongly disagreed. Um, and we'll get into that. But there are changes to installation resistance or rewording. RCD testing, schedule of arms inspected and test results has been changed. Um, a few minor things before we get into it. 642, the checklist adds earth electrode to initial verification, which is fine. Um, and there's also a, a note on test instruments affected by inverters. That's consistent throughout part eight as well, which we'll, we'll cover in a bit. John, do you want to talk about IR testing? Yeah, insulation resistance. Now, this is what's in the blue book, so the old one. Uh, 64331 and the insulation resistance shall be measured between live conductors and between live conductors and the projective conductor connected to the earthing arrangement where appropriate during this measurement line and neutral conductors may be connected together so that's what we had now it's been changed a bit uh, but it's not actually been changed a huge amount but there are some uh, subtle adjustments to this one there are so this is what we've now got in the brown one so the insulation resistance shall be measured between, and then they've separated these two things out. So live conductors and, as a second item, live conductors and protective inductor connected to the earthing arrangement. And during that measurement, line and neutral conductors may be connected together. So the key is you've got the two separate things. So you're doing the live conductors first, and then the second one where you may connect the uh, line and neutral together. Obviously, you want to disconnect your SPDs um, before you do any of that sort of stuff because you're just going to get a dead short. Um, really interesting for this table, John, because, well, you carry on. Yeah. Now, this table is basically a minimum values of insulation resistance for different voltages. Up to and including 500 volts is still one megohm, as it always was. And if you're going to test at 250, it's saying in this table, the minimum insulation resistance is 0.5. However, it says, uh, and this is where this is where six four three 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 is. So, where you've got electronic devices which are likely to influence the results or be damaged, only a measurement between the live conductors connected together and the earthing measurement shall be made. And you may need to uh, disconnect those devices to avoid damage. And let's face it, in a modern installation, that's a huge amount of stuff. And now we get the bit that doesn't really fit. So. Following connection of equipment, a test at 250 volts DC should be applied between live conductors and the protective conductor. The insulation resistance shall have a value of at least one megaohm. So that doesn't really fit in with that table because that said it was supposed to be. Yeah, I think what they've, done, what they've done here, John, is they've been very succinct now that what they're doing is they're saying on initial verification, it's a 500 volt IR test um, and then you can do a 250 volt test. But if you do a 250 volt test with the line conductors connected, still must be a minimum of one meg so it, it is a departure from the table but they're trying i read this regulation as people are cutting corners lashing everything in first six and second fixing and going oh, i haven't megged it i'll just stick 250 volts down it line and neutral together and that's it and then that's not good enough and i think that's why this regulation is in place because people are probably just not bothering to put wagos in on their first fix to test the actual cabling uh, and we know, obviously, like Emma Shaw and stuff, the, the pierced cable. We need to be IR testing this proper, properly. Well, well the, the AT on their webinar is saying that this was actually the actually the cable manufacturers were actually pressing for them to test for you to test for us to test their cables at the five hundred volts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the whole point of this is that if you're going to install the cabling, you test it first before you've attached any of the equipment, so your light sockets or whatever else, at the 500 volts between the line and neutral. And then once you've connected all the other stuff, like your sockets, lights, and all the rest of it, then you test at the 250 volts with the line and neutral connected together. So it's two individual tests, not just sling it in and then just test it all at the end and hope this is all is well. This is to stop people cutting corners to save time. If, it, if it's on, it works, won't go bang, but you're not interrogating the installation correctly. Um, now, this is this beautiful table on RCD testing, which is found in Appendix 3. Now, this is relevant to testing, but why, John? 
Well, this is uh, all the details for RCDs, or at least the most common ones, trip times and how long they're supposed to take, and then obviously the various uh, currents and all the rest of it. And that was in Appendix 3, but now it's gone away. It's been deleted, so it uh, doesn't exist anymore. For those who don't know, I'm a wrestling fan. That's Broken Matt Hardy, who goes around saying delete a lot. I like wrestling. It's, it's, it's my webinar. I just put it in. But yeah, RCD test times. Yeah, check them out the window. Yep. In the Let's bin. the devices. Right. Um, go on, John, you can cover this yeah. one. Yeah, and uh, the reason it's been deleted is because of this. Uh, this is uh, the mainly the part in yellow there. So uh, regardless of RC type, effectiveness is deemed to have been verified where an RCD disconnects within the time stated below with an alternating current test at rated residual operating current. So for general on delay type, 300 milliseconds. So basically this is saying that all you need to do is to do one test at the rated current, which is 30 milliamps for most of them. And if it trips within 300 milliseconds, then that's fine and that's it. So all that other stuff about half and times five has disappeared. So respectfully, I have spoken to the chaps at the IET and said I strongly disagree with this regulation. It's a great book. I think this brings it down. And I think Mr. Skirm has strongly disagreed as well. Now, what this means is basically your half time test, your five times test, your type test, your ramp test, your phase angle, 0 and 180. There's no requirements. So just don't bother. Um, if you follow the guidance from certain industry bodies, you just go to the top of the terminals and test there. What a load of rubbish. Sorry, the bottom of the terminals, the output and test there. Now, this is because of modern electronics capacitance in the circuit um, and lots of manufacturers not wanting stuff to be sent back. Tough. Um, I know there's an argument about stuff breaking and, and failing and all that. Fine, don't go around and disconnect 50% of the circuit. Maybe we need to develop more guidance on how to safely do this. But our advice is do not stop this full testing. And I've told the IET that this is what we're recommending. And they didn't disagree. In fact, the comment from our peers at the IET was, it's a minimum standard. You do what you need to do to verify the safety and performance of the installation. If you're not happy, you're the one standing in front of a judge because the IET mm. won't stand in front of the judge because on page two, this doesn't purport to be accurate or right or form part of a contract. They hold no responsibility for this being right or wrong. You've got to know what you're doing. So for the, for the love of God, keep the people safe. Use those skills. Don't let the industry dumb you down because... I think in 10 years time, it will just be put it in, walk away and leave it. We know we've got a compatibility issue. And if we're not doing our due diligence, someone's going to get seriously hurt. And I don't want anyone watching this ever to be having an awkward time fretting because one of their installations has caught fire or someone's got hurt. So don't ignore that bit, please. Um, moving on, model forms. Electrical installation certificate. Um, Can I just make one comment, Paul? Sorry, on, that, on, the, on the RCDs again. If you are going to test them, Make sure you test them properly. You know, if you're gonna, if you are gonna test the type A, you know, make sure you you test it and you get the results you expect for a type A, not necessarily type A C, um, because there's there's differences. But that we'll cover that later. Yeah. So just on that as well, we have an RCD webinar that I've been working on <clears throat> for four years. Um, it's nearly done. I've written to every manufacturer and they've all with the same questions. They've all given me different answers. We will go through RCDs with a fine tooth comb um, in a couple of months' time. But back to the certificate, um, Sorry. schedule of inspections is new. So whilst it's simplified here, there is still the detailed breakdown of schedule of inspections. But on the main EIC, it's those 14 items, very simply, a tick or a not applicable or whatever, um, just to make, the, I think, it more simpler. Personally, they shouldn't have touched this. They should just left the schedule appended to the certificate. There was no need for this whatsoever. I don't understand it. And they're dumbing stuff down. But moving on to the generic schedule of circuit details, there is now a space for your company logo. There is now a, a requirement to put what SPD detail there is and also the RCD column. So what they do is they took that really compacted certificate, that one page, and they've now spread it across two and given you more space and changed it for the current requirement of type, te type of RCD and SPD. So this to me is a lot better, more legible, good for apprentices to print out um, and actually just work on and practice. And then on the generic schedule of test results, they have recognized the fact that we all use MFTs now. Um, and yes, yeah, so they've allowed for a multifunction bit at the top there. So that's generally the EIC certificate. Now, the minor works, I'm loving, by the way, the minor works, because this is what I wanted 20 years ago. So there's more information on the back guidance. 
but on the minor work certificate as you can see it's broken down to your description your date your comments on the installation your earthing and bonding which you must do 13216 absolutely check to make sure it's there before you alter your circuit details they've added now rcd afdd spd types ratings etc the rated current which is good that's a new addition and also as we said about voltage earlier on john they now require you to declare the ir test voltage for your minor yeah. works so great improvement on the minor works i think that's fantastic moving on to the model for me i see um not really much of a change there really to be honest with you at all but on the schedule of items inspected at the back there is obviously a breakdown um and this breakdown obviously as you see the one to 14 there is a section on the intake equipment section one 1.1 says service cable service head earthing arrangement meter tails mutant equipment and isolator but then it says note one where inadequacies in the intake are encountered which may result in a dangerous or potentially dangerous situation the person ordering the work and or the duty holder which is the homeowner uh, or the business owner it is strongly recommended that the person ordering the work informs the appropriate authority so get someone else to do it even though you are a competent person so i'm already disagreeing with this but note two is something else for this section only where inadequacies are found an x should be put against the appropriate item hmm okay so let's go into eicr coding we all know c1 i can see it i can touch it it'll kill me now c2 uh one thing goes wrong someone's going to get hurt c3 yeah bit pony really fi further investigation okay they're the four bread and butter codes technically does this mean now we've got an x code damage two possible discrepancy with the dno equipment now my conversations yesterday uh alex was if i find the dno head hanging off the wall but everything else is fine technically the installation is satisfactory that's how i'm interpreting this now i've seen the new code breaker book i i, I got it yesterday and it mm -hmm. does have x on all the dno codes with the exception of access to live parts now i'm going to say this again as a electrician chartered engineer and fellow ignore x codes i don't want anyone to pass an installation where the dno is unsatisfactory you do not want to be called in front of a judge and asked to explain yourself because someone's small child has died. You do not want that. So keep doing your due diligence. This is a minimum standard. I think it's fairly evident this has worked its way into maybe under pressure from the energy networks people and the DNOs who are overwhelmed by really thorough and competent electricians saying this is not good enough, pal. Get your backside down here. So Xcode, thanks for that. I'll see you later. Um, just on the DNO intakes, I thought I'd give you a, a little briefing on DNC, divert neutral current, because in our wonderful new guidance note, GN3, um, section 3.3.3 and appendix D now deals with diverted neutral current safety checks. So hurrah, it's only taken us years, but it's in there. Um, please note in guidance note three, there is a mistake because it refers to appendix E, which doesn't exist. So um, it doesn't matter because it's the last one in the book. It requires safety checks. And just for everyone who may not have watched our Diverted Neutral Current webinar, um, that's a standard installation, that's normal, and I've changed this to align with the intent of GN3. So as your normal installation, your pen conductor is in blue where it's combined with your earthing, you can see the energy flowing in and out, and that's fine, and you've got your water and gas bonds running in parallel. Now, imported uh, Diverted Neutral Current, because you can get imported or exported, is where you have a break in your pen conductor between two and three, and what it will do is it will import from three onto the water and gas networks back into two and then back down to the substation but not all that energy because it will go in multiple directions and multiple paths if it was exported i'll give you an example that would be exported so single phase supply tncs a broken pen in the street um, and the neutral current would be then exported onto the water and gas networks okay now one of the things we said in the webinar as well divert neutral current it recommends a clamp check, which we've been saying about. So if you haven't got one, please go and get one. Also, these voltage uh, contact pens, these are great. They're about 30 quid on Amazon. Um, do these basic checks, introduce them into your safety toolbox. They're really important. One of the other things that we said, divert neutral current is a precursor to a full broken pen, which then means when you switch something on, you can get a very hazardous voltage rise and kill someone. So it's a precursor to a voltage. The current comes before the voltage here. 
it's worthwhile just hammering that home. Um, if you don't believe us, if you watch the webinar, you know that we put clamp meetings on things, especially me, and get some weird and amazing readings. Part seven, John, do you want to cover that? Yeah, we'll cover this one. Uh, we're not going to go to every single bit in nope. detail because obviously that will be far too tedious and take too long. So um, first of all, bathroom 701, uh, sources for Selv and Pelv. And the change here is that uh, where Selv and Pelv is used in zone 01 or 2, a source described in regulation 4143, section 4, shall not be used. And what that actually is, is that certain electronic devices complying with the appropriate standards where provisions have been taken such that even in the case of fault, the voltage of the outgoing terminals cannot see the values specified in 41411. High voltages at the terminals are permitted in the case of contact with a live part or in the event of a fault between live parts and exposed conductor parts, assuming the voltage at the output is immediately reduced to the value specified in regulation 41411. Yeah. So essentially those devices you cannot use anymore in bathrooms, swimming pools, and saunas. Yeah, that's kind of it, really, isn't it? It's the whole electronics as a protection method around damp people and wet areas. Not a good idea. Yeah. And, and some of these things with the little transformers that say things like cell with equivalent on them and various other dubious oh, wording. Right. So uh, you can't use them anymore. And then the other main thing for bathrooms is that the distance socket outlets need to be from the edge of the bath or shower instead of three meters. Now it's 2.5 meters. So that 50 centimeter difference, they're making no difference to anybody. I would love to see the statistics for how many people have had an electric shock while using their mobile phone in the bath plugged in or something like that, because I, I, I don't, I just don't see the point in it. I know, I know somebody said it was about harmonizing with Europe, but John, I'm pretty yeah, sure it's, it's, so not. it's not. Yeah, well, Europe doesn't, most of Europe doesn't have that at all. So uh, yeah. So anyway, there's the diagram. So it's 2.5 meters minimum from the edge of zone zero to a socket outlet. And previously it was three. So uh, there you go. Huge change. Now, uh, swimming pools uh, 702. This is basically the same thing we just saw. So again, where solar power is used in those zones, you can't use a source described in 4143 for anymore. It's the exact same thing. So you can't use it there either. And rooms and cabins with sauna heaters, That's well, amazing. guess what? It's the same thing again. So yeah, you can't use them there either. So basically these particular electronic devices you can't use in a whole horde of places. So uh, good riddance, quite frankly. Uh, 706, which is conducting locations with restricted movement. Uh, where functional earthing is required, supplementary protective equipment one should be provided between all exposed conductive parts Strenuous connected parts and the terminals for functional earthing. Yep. And then there's an example there. At medical locations, this should look familiar because, yes, it's those things again that you can't use. So, once again, you can't use them there either. And uh, medical locations still, types of RCDs, this again just fits in with what we've seen previously. So, type AC RCDs shall not be used. So, again, removed from there as well. So it's going to be A, B or F, depending on the possible fault currents. Yeah, because you don't want RCDs tripping people out of medical locations and killing them if they're on dialysis. No. So there's a very, if you're ever doing anything in medical or NHS areas, please look up group one and two and study and don't make these mistakes. Um, on 7.12, my favourite section. Um, this has had the much needed rewrite uh, and additions that was needed. So I... I've done quite a lot of PV over the last couple of years and I've had many a debate and row with my solar contractor because I sat and read the BSEN standards as Mr. Skirm has inspired us to do. And one of the things that BSEN standards said is you'll have DC isolation, you'll have AC isolation, you'll have surge protection on the DC side and you'll have surge protection on the AC side. Now, my contractor said, don't be silly. Why would we do that? Don't be silly, la, 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 la. Well, 712 was basically just aligned um, to include that uh, and making sure that you have the right type of RCD protection. Um, and yeah, exactly what I said, AC isolation, DC isolation and surge protection. There's lots of other stuff, lots of formulas and calcs. We could do an entire hour on 712, but I think it's got better. So I'm gonna leave it there because there's lots of technical stuff um, and it is quite a fascinating area and I think 
it's it's got more mature now so um yeah anyone want any more advice speak to stuart cato because he's really good at it um outdoor lighting installations uh additional protection so uh, a change here lighting that is accessible to the public shall have additional protection by an rcd um having the characteristics specified in for one five so minimum type a and it gives examples gardens spaces to the public telephone kiosks bus shelters and advertising panels uh, made a mistake in choose this one i included railways so don't be silly we wouldn't have them but this is all driven from that um that poor fatality of that small child in the in the pub um where the owners should have been thrown in prison to rot but i'm not going to get involved engaged in that but yeah there was a death of a small child in in romford uh, where they were climbing on a fence and poor installation so this is trying to prevent that so when you're doing your yards in pub just be mindful of some of the lash ups that you see in their um, beer gardens. John, over to you. Right, uh, 722 electric vehicle charging installations. This is the one that's been changed a lot. And in fact, the uh, previous amendment was just changes to this only. And they've changed it once again. Now, there aren't too many changes on this one. Uh, the first one here is uh, 7241141, the <coughs> PME earthing facility. Uh, this is the thing that currently or previously had five different choices in it. The first one of which is what's shown there, which was where you have a three phase installation, which was essentially balanced or nearly balanced all the time. That has been deleted, so you can't use it anymore. But the thing is, nobody used it anyway, because let's face it, having a perfectly balanced three phase system all the time is pretty much impossible anyhow. And if it was for an AC supplied uh, vehicle charging equipment, then it was impossible because if someone comes along with a single phase vehicle, which most of them are plugs it in, well, straight away there's your unbalanced load. So been deleted, so you can't use it anymore. But the reality is nobody used it anyway because say it was pretty much next to impossible to do anyway. And uh, continuing on with the PME earthing facility, we've now got an additional section at the end, and this covers all of these uh, devices and things which various manufacturers have been uh, turning out. So. Where equipment to be used is not covered by a British or harmonised standard, or where there is no British or harmonised standard for the functionality of a piece of equipment used, it is the responsibility of the electrical installation designer or other person responsible for specifying the installation to establish that, number one, the equipment meets the requirements of the Electrical Equipment Safety Regulations 2016, the Electromagnetic Compatibility Regulations 2016, and any other relevant legislation. And the equipment either has a CE, UK, CIR or UK NI mark and the Declaration of Conformity, where third party approval is required, the equipment is marked appropriately. And the Declaration of Conformity is to be appended to the certification for initial verification. So this is a fairly large amount of stuff that's been added. So it's now up to the uh, person installing it to get all of this stuff and actually make sure it does comply with the various things there and attach the information to the uh, certificate that you're filling so in. So we're, we're just allowing Mr. Skirm to simmer. He's going to explode in a second, and I'm going to let him right. in in a minute, but let's just carry on with this. Carry on with the notes. And, yeah, and note three, we've got a new one here, uh, again on the PME earthing facility. So creating a TT earthing system for charging equipment or the whole installation as an alternative to using one of those uh, four methods now may not be an appropriate solution due to the inability to provide sufficient separation from buried net metal work connected to the supply pen conductor. So this is a thing where you've got, say, a row of terrace houses, they're all uh, PME or TNCS. You can't realistically change one of them to TT because they're all far too close to all the other stuff connected. So just saying, oh, we'll change it to TT is very often not possible and not a viable solution. Ironic, John, if you don't mind me saying, it talks about an appropriate solution to do the separation, okay? If I then go to a uh, Annex 722, which is the guidance for TN systems, where PME applies, bottom of, of 722.4, it says, it's recommended the minimum separation distance is two meters. And at this separation distance, the device should be arranged to operate at 40 volts. That is a new regulation. And I'm literally reading that now to everyone live, but that's interesting. So in the annex, it's two meters they're recommending. So yeah, something's going on here because there's obviously some additional recommendations, but I will push this along onto RCDs. Yep, and uh, this is, uh, say RCDs again. Again, this fits in with what we've seen uh, previously. So the real change here is specifying the types of RCDs, so type A, F or B. Previously, it just said 
RCDs in general, and again, type AC is no longer permitted. In reality, type AC wasn't permitted here anyway, but uh, it's just uh, spelling out the actual types that you're allowed to use. Indeed. And uh, this one fits in with part eight, which we'll look at in a moment. So this is for a PEI or a prosumer's electrical installation. And it just requires that uh, the vehicle should be electrically disconnected from live conductors of the supply and from the protective earth in accordance with that regulation in island mode, unless the manufacturer's device confirms it will continue to provide protection. And again, that all fits in with part eight, which we'll uh, no. see. Really, that's a really important bit as well, John, is, is the manufacturer has to confirm it will work in island mode because yeah. we're heading that way of island mode. But just on this, um, a point I want to raise, 7224141, half the press, we're always reading this. I um, mean, it's the clause two, it says, the, you know, the main earthing term of the installation is connected by an electrode. There's a note that says Annex 722 um, gives guidance on determining the maximum resistance required for earth electrodes, which is great. See note one. If I go to note one, it says earth electrodes with resistance above 200 ohms may be unstable. OK. Thank you for that brick wall. We, we know that anything above 200 ohms is unstable. Thanks for that. Now what? Kind of stops there, really. Bit of a weird one. I discussed this with the IET yesterday when I was at this stand, but just thought I'd raise it here. Um, John, let's go for part eight. Yeah, part eight is uh, new. It's functional requirements. Now, we have covered this in a previous one. It's uh, all basically been pulled in from another standard. So scope of 821 is the local production and storage of energy. So that's batteries, solar panels, wind turbines and a little diagram there, all of those. And the term prosumer basically comes from two words, which is producer and consumer of energy. So it's the first bit of one and the second half of the other one. And this is also where we get the PEI, the prosumer's electrical installation. And again, these things exist already. Lots of people have solar, quite a lot of people have batteries. Not many have wind turbines, but it's the same principles that you're generating electricity within your property. And you can either use that or send it out into the grid. You can bring power in from the grid. So it's this multi-directional flow of energy at various times. John, can I just add here for anyone doing this, anyone who works in an installation where you have solar and a fire alarm, um, ask yourself a very simple question. In activation of fire alarm, do you have a link to the solar system to switch it off? That's a really important for firefighter safety because obviously it's a, it's a generator set. So if you have a commercial industrial center where you have this, um, and lots do, I have them on my railway, um, we need to make sure that we link the fire alarm system. So in the event we shut the inverters off, which offers a better protection to firefighting activities and all the rest of it. Sorry, John, I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, that's fine. Now, uh, this diagram is from uh, UK Power <coughs> Networks. Again, we'll uh, see some links to those at the end. <coughs> And uh, this really illustrates, it says they're the future of the energy system, but actually a lot of this stuff already exists and people are already using it. So this is sort of now and the fairly near future. And it just shows how complex this whole system is now going to get. It's not the just case of a bit of generation comes in your house and you use it. You've got multiple sources of energy. It's flowing in multiple directions between all of these different devices and different buildings and different systems. So very, very complex. And it's going to get even worse as we move forward. Now, 824 covers modes, and this is your how your prosumer's electric installation can operate. First one, which is island mode, that's where you are disconnected from the grid, but it's remaining energized. So you're going to be running on your batteries. And then you've got your connected modes, which is where you are connected to the grid. So sort of the more conventional arrangement where you're bringing power in from the grid. That actually divides into two individual parts. And I just add that you're not required under 7601 to dress as a pirate when you're in island mode. No, it's optional. Yeah. Uh, so um, <laughs> two connecting modes, direct feeding mode, which is the traditional way of energy comes in from the grid and it's supplying your house or PAI with energy. But there was also reverse feeding mode where you are supplying the grid with energy. So you've got your battery storage, batteries powering and going out into the grid or your solar's putting out into the grid. And where that happens, the energy companies will pay you for the electricity that you're providing them. And again, this is already happening because lots of people already uh, have solar, which can export. Types of prosumer's electrical installation. We've got the individual, which is by far the simplest. So it's a single property, public network there. So the power can come in. And inside there, you've got power supplies, 
loads and also storage. So that's your simplest one. It's just a single unit and it's got the uh, single connection to the grid itself contained. The next type is a collective. So you've still got the public network connection there and that's DSO now. Multiple loads in multiple properties there. So it could be a block of flats or a set of people there. And then you've got power supplies and storage as a separate item. But the key there is that can be used to supply any or all of the units we've got there. So it's sort of a single item to be used collectively. And of course, collectively means, of course, it's the Borg collective. So nice, easy way to remember that. Yeah, and Gene Roddenberry does not endorse BSM671. This is just our weird humour. But yeah, big Star Trek fan. Although you should, I still say you should have used Deep Space Nine, but there you go. Anyway. <laughs> and then uh, the third type is shared. This is similar to the collective, but the different series, you've got the network coming in, three properties in this particular case, multiple units which have got supply, loads and storage or some combination of in the individual unit. So in that case, we've got say, first one's got all three. Supplying and storage is optional. Of course, they're all going to have a load in them, obviously. Mm -hmm. And again, they can share energy between themselves or send it back out to the grid. So it's all a sort of a sharing arrangement there. With this particular thing, you can also have it so it can be connected within the private network. So you could actually supply your neighbor. So if you do a disconnect from the grid for some reason, you could literally supply your neighbor's house with your batteries and there'd be some kind of billing arrangement. So you could uh, charge them money for them using your power when there was a grid failure and all kinds of other interesting stuff. Uh, new definition here, electrical energy management system or EEMS. This is a device or collection of devices which basically manages the whole of the system or prosumer's electrical installation. So you've got your connection to the grid, local energy production, local energy consumption, energy procurement, as in buying it in from the grid, and of course also exporting as well. And uh, there is an annex in there, which is D82, or you can just go and have a look at uh, 60364.8-1, which unfortunately you'll have to pay for, and it's very expensive. Yeah, and that, that, that uh, 60364R81 was was a draft in the 18th edition and we rejected it. And in hindsight, I hope in Amendment 3, this comes back in because without this, it yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah, we're kind of missing half of it. Um, mm -hmm. Why it's not included, who knows, but it's not. Indeed. Uh, technical issues or basic things to consider here, which may not be the same as uh, a normal system. Protection against electric shock. Operating modes can change at any time. So it could be an island mode or separated or it could be connected to the grid. And whatever protection you've got in place must be effective in all modes. So if you're going to switch to island mode, you still have to have the uh, protection in place. For protection against electric shock, the earthing type may change. So if you go to island mode, it might not be a uh, TNCS supply anymore. It could be IT or even a TT. So for island mode, you do need an earth electrode. It will be disconnected from the public network completely and you'll need a neutral switching device, which may need to connect neutral and earth together, depending on what earthing type you're actually going to be using. Yep. And earth fault current, so again, it could be a TN system, a TT or an IT, it's gonna be different types of protection for each mode, and you may need two different devices, one for each of the uh, operating modes there. And isolation. Again, you've got to isolate each source. You've got to isolate from the public network. And think about where the origin of the installation is, because that, again, might not be obvious, particularly if you're changing into different modes. It could actually move, or the supply of energy is going to be different. So, again, it's far more complex. It's not just, here's the big old main switch. You may need several different isolation points, depending on the mode that it's operating in. And protection against overcurrent. Obviously, it's necessary. You've got to consider a short circuit current at all points within your prosumer's electrical installation, the direction of the current and the polarity, a combination of different power supplies connected. So you could have the grid there, batteries, solar panels, all of these different things here, and the location of the fault relative to those. And again, depending on where the actual supplies are coming from at the particular time the fault occurs, that may determine where the protected device or devices is actually placed. Now, outage of public networks, so if the grid goes away for whatever reason, 
do you switch to island mode and keep running or do you disconnect all of the power? So there are those choices. And you also need to consider the uh, duty requirements of the devices that switch and disconnect you from the public network. It's not just something that's going to be used, say, once or twice. This could happen very often or, in fact, quite regularly if you're disconnecting and connecting back to the grid. And the hazard, John, if you have diverted neutral current and you're switching earth in, yep, you, know, you need to right. consider all this sort of stuff. So the rating of your contactors, et cetera, your switching devices, management of arcs. Um, this all needs to be thought of. And there is an IT uh, guidance note, code of practice for energy storage is quite good, um, but we'll, we're not going to cover that more today. And uh, transit low voltage or, or basically surge protection, you're going to be switching between sources all the time. So that's going to be a big creator of uh, transit over voltages. Load shedding, that's where you would disconnect some substantial loads to uh, avoid overloading the grid or your local system. So surge protection is required for prosumer electric installations. No question about it. It's uh, going to be needed just because of the uh, huge amounts of switching and different energy systems coming in. And uh, 862, which is interaction with the public network, your prosumer electric installation is to comply with the supply requirements of voltage frequency. There is an annex, which is C82 in BS7671. And there's also a website, decode.org.uk, which has some additional information that is also a free website so well worth having a look on that one now energy storage chiefly this is going to be batteries but could be uh, other types of systems you need to consider the inrush current and other capabilities when you're going to be switching between modes flexibility of loads and generators Design property of load shedding. So again, that's where you're going to disconnect certain high loads at certain times to avoid, uh, say, destroying your battery generation system or protecting the grid. And guess what? That's in that 6036481, which isn't included. So you'll have to buy it. Yeah. And, and there's an 8-3, which tells you more. So. Yes, that's not included either. So we've got basically 8-2, which is essentially what uh, this uh, part is. But uh, eight one is not included, and eight three, which is actually how to operate all this equipment, is not included either. Yeah, I think part eight's going to sit and just let us chew the fat yeah. and digest how we're going to do it for a few years before we start really applying it in anger. Yeah, they sort of bunged it in there. And uh, electric vehicle charging, of course, a big part of prosumer electric installations. There's an entire uh, car there. A electric vehicle is a load and a storage device because it's a, basically a big battery on wheels. It's not permanently connected and it should be managed by the EEMS or the Electrical Energy Management System. And uh, generally they are. The EEMS can be a single piece of equipment or it can be a set of different bits of equipment which uh, connect together. And you can already get things like this where you can plug in your car to charge at say only certain times or at certain actual rates, depending if your solar panels are generating and that type of thing. I will never have an EEMS because I refuse to have a smart meter. So mm. I'm out of luck there. Oh well. And uh, selectivity, again, this is the principle where you've got a uh, downstream device operates and the upstream device does not. So that's a fairly understood concept there. However, in terms of uh, a prosumer electric installation, there can be a problem here because it depends on where the energy is coming from as to which order your protective devices might be in. So, say your power is coming from your batteries, it's going to be coming in a different direction as from the solar or the grid. So what is upstream and downstream and that may actually change depending on the operating mode you're in whether you're in island mode or on uh, connected mode so again a lot of other stuff to think about there it's not just oh we put the devices in because you may need other devices or a different set of devices to actually work correctly when there's a fault in the different modes yeah this is why i looked at the code of practice for energy storage because that seems to have an in two installations in parallel with some switching devices to enable you to do the load shedding and switching but Again, get the book, guys. And uh, testing and verification, 867. Loop impedance tester instruments may not work properly with inverters. Now, inverters are pretty much a major part of this because that's what converts your DC from your solar panels into AC and also what will convert your batteries into AC. And apparently some of them may not work properly with it. And you do need to test these things when the various different sources are actually connected because again, you're going to get completely different results depending on where the energy is coming from. Yeah, this annoys me because uh, I grew up testing UPSs and inverters 
and we would always do all the tests of it on bypass then switch it in and test it again and if the equipment failed then you're not buying that equipment again but i'm i'm i don't like this manufacturer pressure to say that it, their equipment influences test results that inverter and i'll use a ups as example should perform in normal duty on bypass and if there's a fault in an emergency and it's on battery mode it should still disconnect it should still i mean i one of the biggest challenges i see with ups is is the fault current generated won't trip the breakers that it's feeding so if there is a fault during that emergency it won't trip and there could be someone working on it in emergency and they'll just get cooked by the uh, the feed so that's generally not a nice thing and the industry has been dealing with that and uh, alternative methods of determining loop appears fault current yeah it's not really something that's going to be recommended there but dave mentioned are... this in the last webinar about the r1 r2 plus zs and resistance yeah. and impedance and you can't mathematically add them up and paul's already nodding and getting wound up by the sheer concept so we disagree fundamentally with the whole ze plus r1 r2 and all that it just doesn't work and at some point we might do a podcast explaining why but not today now this is in addition to tuesday corrigendum um We've kind of already covered the minor little bits in GN3 and maybe the brick walls. Overall, I still think the book's really good. Maybe in a month or two's time, there might be a corrigendum. Based on what I've seen, I don't think there will be. I, I think everything's too minor, to be honest with you, but happy to be proved wrong. Um, just before you all disappear, um, please stay. Uh, there's free knowledge. So one of the things we've always been asked about is, where do I find this? I can't afford the standards. Well, you don't need to afford the standards and let me take you on a very short journey. So a couple of things that we need to be wary of, whether we like it or not, the government are doing this net zero strategy. There's also an energy task force. How do we get all these charges? 1.6 billion investment from the government. They want 300,000 charges by 2035 released today. Um, the Her Majesty's government taking charge, electric vehicle strategy released two weeks ago. The ECA have commented on it. These are all Googleable, if that's a word. Um, please go and look at them because if you're a business owner, this is really important. If you're an apprentice and you want to know what the, the journey of your career is going to be, if you want to do EV, this will help tell you how to adapt, improvise and fit into that, that river of money that you will be swimming in. Um, just on OPEN, because I'm sure someone's put in the questions, we are doing a podcast on this very soon on G12. Um, there is a section in G12 that talks about supplementary electrodes, the use of PME, and it talks about EV charging points. It currently states, and this was updated, by the way, in 2022, not 2021. That's a mistake on the cover. Um, it talks about protection against neutral fault, uh, et cetera. And then it says where open neutral detection and earth disconnection is used, the designer, installer and owner of the device must ensure the device is designed, installed, maintained and operated to protect the members of the public from risks associated with the rise of voltage. How does the installer do that after he leaves? He's got to get the design right. Uh, in the event of open neutral. As a minimum requirement, any no open neutral detection and earth device must be designed to comply with the guidance in the current version of 7671. But Mr. Skirm will tell you 7671 is not a product standard. It's an installation standard. So it must comply with all relevant national and international technical construction and design standards. Well, I don't know that they even exist. Um, so they then put this little note um, at the time of writing, no definitive product standards were in existence for design and construction of open neutral detection and earth detection device until such standards are developed. In addition to requirements above, it should be demonstrated that the device is fit for purpose by type testing, certification and independent test center. I ain't seen any of that. And if you ask the manufacturers, please do be interested to see what you get back. But you need to verify a response to all likely fault scenarios all typical system and environmental conditions. It locks out on a fault detection. Um, it demonstrates it cannot falsely operate under expected network operating conditions and it's fail safe, which mm. to me says don't connect a device that detects broken pens unless you've got that. Never seen it. What do you think, Paul? No, never seen it myself. Um, you know, this smacks of requiring a performance level or a SIL. It's an electrical electronic programmable safety device. There are international standards for electrical electronic program of safety devices. The 61508 series, 62061 is various, depending on which, uh, which industry you look at. Um, I have never, ever seen any evidence um, that the Sparks have sent me, because I don't bother with these things, um, of, a, of any broken pen detection device that I would say that, 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 that 
gives me confidence to say that it is compliant and legal to be placed on the market. I've not seen one. So we're going to stop me with any information. We will stop there and move on because we can talk about this afterwards. Um, for everyone watching, um, there is some amazing free information. Now, Eaton did an Amendment 2 document on Monday. Um, you can download that from Eaton's websites. But they have, if you just Google Residual Current Devices Application Guide, you will get amazing knowledge. Um, and Eaton have had that out for years. More importantly, as we were talking about earth leakage, which John mentioned earlier on, there is a guide called Earth Fault Protection. And as you can see, it looks at the 60335 series of standards, which if John bought would cost you how many mortgages, John? About 20,000 quid, I think it is. Comes About 20,000 quid. Yeah. So that gives you more breakdown of maximum leakage current. It's free. You don't need to buy the standards. You know the formula from here. You've got the, you've got the information in front of you. Um, one other thing I'm going to say is Schneider, you want to learn Schneider have an electrical installation guide, which is for designers. So if you want to get into design as an apprentice or at any level in this industry, it takes you through the IEC standards. And if you're not aware, the IEC standards form and inform 7671. So you may see something that's not in 7671. It may appear in the future or it may be separate. But the fundamental principles are littered throughout. It's a brilliant document. It's free. It's about 500 pages. I've actually got a printed copy right here on my shelf. It's awesome. They do great guides for GRP containment. Why would you use GRP? What, what, what reason? Industrial cable supports, pull testing, cable management products, wiring accessories. They do some really good. There is knowledge. It's not just a catalog. There's knowledge extracted from standards that we may not be able to afford. So I highly recommend going and getting these sorts of things. Moving on to the report that UK Power Networks allowed us to freely use the images from. This is the consultation report for Future Smart. So this is what we do when we're not doing this research, research, research. So you can download it from ukpowernetworks.co, interest about us, Future Smart, just Google Future Smart Report. These images are in it and a whole plethora of, of thought pieces. And this is our intent to manage the network. If you want to be ahead of the curve, read this sort of stuff. Um, other things that are really interesting, cable management, Dan knows I hate when cable management is installed and five years later is rotten. So um, I'm using Legrand as an example, by the way, not sponsored by any of these guys. Um, they've got great examples that talk about pollution categories for installations, which is still isn't, seven, in, isn't in 7671 other than the reference of external influences. So it's not just a product guide, it's a technical guide that talks to you about how to select the thickness of galvanic finishes, where to install, all the logic and reasoning you need buried in these wonderful documents to teach and educate you and make you better. Um, lastly, I'm just going to say that this isn't just us doing it. Um, I take my hat off to the industry because when we started doing this, not many people were doing engaging stuff. Now we've got the NIC doing the roadshows, NAPIT are doing their roadshows, smaller and intimate, the ECA Project 18. You've got CEF with the IET doing tech talks. You've got Alex, Fix Radio, I do stuff with Tom. And of course, Mr. Ward, videos coming soon. And Mr. Ninja, I'm expecting a full amendment to debrief at some point. I know he's not going to talk because he's got COVID and isn't feeling very well. So I take my hat off to everyone in the industry. Thank you for leveling up and providing free accessible CPD. Um, and yeah, that's that's it. Two hours on the money. Now let's do questions. If you're going to leave, I'd just like to thank you all on behalf of everybody for joining us. Hopefully on YouTube, you've enjoyed this. We'll still cover the questions on it, but this has been a hard week. So hopefully it's been worth it. And thank you very much. So let's get on the questions. Who wants to do the Q&A hosting? Should we go through them? John, do you want to start yeah, with Mr. Betteridge? Uh, have a look then. Yeah, Dave Betteridge. Uh, we've got, uh, within the application of the verbal forms in uh, BS 761 table, I uh, can't read this. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. I've got it on my screen. So Mr. Beveridge says, okay. with the application of the verbal forms in 7671 Table 1, I have a question regarding the recommendation in it being a should, but then being informative. What if, for example, AFDD was recommended to an installation, but it was not installed and a fire happened? What would happen to your Reg 29 if the curly herd person asks? Maybe an explanation of normative informative. Paul, have, I think we covered this at the start. Yeah, we have in a way in that basically um, we've with if you're going to get if you're not going to fit AFDDs or if you're not going to fit surge protection, um, you need to get the OK 
from the client and the understanding the client knows what the the consequences of that decision are and get it in writing you mm-hmm. know and, and and get them to understand what they are signing because they are signing um they're signing the deviation from bsm 671 and then and, and make them clear make that clear to them you know they are the ones that is taking that responsibility and they're taking okay. that responsibility off you right mr Berridge, you're banned from questions um, uh, there's a chap called Chris Theobald. During the last webinar, there was dis- some discussion on SH- LSOH cables. Could this and their recognition of the regs be further expanded upon? Anyone want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. Cool. Um, so, well, see, I don't know what I said in the last webinar because I wasn't present, but, um, but um, this is a common thing. Uh, I'm assuming, is this Chris about LSF? And LS. John, do you want to just explain briefly, repeat what you said in the last one about? Yeah, it was about the fact that if you got the normal PVC cables, if they get on fire, they turn into massive piles of black smoke. And obviously that's not what you want. And then the other types are ones that don't do that. And then they also don't have the thing with the um, arcing between the conductors because the insulation doesn't degrade in that way. OK. The, the, the way I've read this question is, and I get asked it a lot, what's the difference between LSF and LSOH um, cables? Um, and one of the slides we spoke about was about the um, what you mentioned, Paul, um, about the, the 60%. And my understanding is that it, when LSF cables are tested, because they, they're manufactured with PVC, it's a bit like they might pass, they might not. Whereas LSOH cables, they're designed to pass that standard and that requirement. Yeah, I mean, my understanding has always been there are different categories of tests for fire performance of cables. So there'll be acid emissions, smoke emissions, uh, ash drop tests, etc. The higher up you go, so your LSF was your basic, you know, low smoke type cable, um, but there were nasty toxins like halogen and stuff. So they were removing those chemical components which they found could cause harm. Um, and the higher up you go on the greater cables, the less smoke would be emitted and the higher resistance to fire, henceforth BS8519, which is a great standard for safety services and requires a very high standard. But again, we're not cable experts. Maybe we'll get a cable manufacturer on to talk about it more, but that's always been my understanding. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, right, Mark O'Sullivan. We've got 14 questions to go through. Uh, just a quick one, the installation of earth rods back up on a TN. Is this for new builds or after September data requirement for say a CU change? Um, it, and Chris has answered it's recommended change. And Mr. Betridge has said, oh, we, we'll get him on the next one. I uh, recommended should informative. I do wonder what happens when it all goes wrong. My reg 25, 29 is needed. Um, yeah, it's recommended. It's down to you. It's it, it's not always practicable. It's not exactly. always practicable to, to install. Uh, yeah, I, they're not uh, saying put a, an earth electrode at every it's install. You can't if it's a block of flats. No. So it's if it not. is practical, put one in. If you're doing a rewire and it's going to be possible to put one in, put it in. Yeah. 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 And and the homeowner um, obviously uh, can afford it. And you've done some checks. I, I wouldn't install one if I knew I had diverted neutrals. That's for sure, because I'd make it worse. I'd exacerbate the problem. Um, but anyway, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question, Mr. O'Sullivan. Um, Mr. Oh God, Mr. Betridge, again, you need to talk to us in Discord afterwards because where did Foundation Earth go? We got a little closer with the electrode in parallel. It's gone. Get over it. It's just, yeah, it's just gone. So I'm as gutted as you are, but it's it will end up probably yeah. coming back in some form, but it's small steps. We got, yeah. we got something. So. Exactly. Um, Marcus Allen said, if it's a recommendation with the client have to sign a declaration saying they didn't want one. Mm. I'm on the ramifications if it goes wrong, really, and how, how yeah. twitchy you are. I, if, it's, to... if it's SPD, fit it, period. Yeah. If it's if it's AFDD, yeah. Give Think about who They're is electricians. Yeah. Think about who the client actually is, because if it's someone who understands stuff, fine. If it's just Mrs. Jones in their little bungalow, well. No. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Paul um, Cross, Mr. Cross says CU type checking. Luden produce own branded CUs and devices for likes of Denman's steeple. SPDs aren't available under the steeple brand, but are under Luden brand. <clears throat> would mixing be allowed, disallowed? I think the obvious answer is, is you would need to speak to the manufacturer of the assembly and they would need to give you confirmation in writing, which you would append to the certificate. Yep. 
that. Hopefully that answers that. Um, Chris again, what kind of, oh, he's asked a few. What kind of situation would involve air conditioning introducing a dangerous voltage being buried in the ground seems rare. You mean the, um, the, the air conditioning paperwork, perhaps, the copper paperwork going between the condenser, the evaporator and stuff? Yeah. Um, well, if they were going for a wall, it wouldn't be extraneous. But if they were buried in the ground I would, and come back up, then I, you would technically deem them extraneous. Yeah, or this is the, they um... were fixed to the ground outside the building with metallic fixings? Yeah, or, or in an adjacent building that's remote from, and they've got different earthing systems. And remember, we're, all we're trying to do in an equipotential zone is equalise voltages. Yeah. That's it. I know I hate the big word. One day, if I get my way, I'll change it to equal voltage, but you never know. Um, Chris Fox, with the new amendment, do you think it will have influence on coding free ICRs? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Stay tuned for our EICR coding webinar, which hopefully will get Mr. Dempsey in as well. Um, so, yes, it will do. Um, and for me, C2 for type A CRCD, sorry to upset people. And yes, it does mean that saying you installed a year ago, you may end up, you should never have been installed in ACRCDs, but everyone went for the gold rush of cheap boards. Uh, Chris again has asked, could you please go into some depth on earth electrodes on TN systems connected in prosumers, especially when islanding? Um, I could, but then I'd be repeating and reading the words from the battery storage book, and I haven't got time. But Mr. Theobald, what we'll do is we'll do some research and we'll do a podcast on it. Because we, I'm speaking to the author of it at the moment, as Paul is, to get a greater understanding, because there is one small error in that book on islanding and switching. But um, So yes, bear with us, because it's new. Um, and yes, lots of people are asking those questions because they're asking them at Alex as well. Um, but I can't give you an answer on here because my brain is fried from four days of reading this darn book. Um, Dave Betridge again. Can an, I'm, oh, can an AFDD device be installed to a consumer unit as a retrofit? Kind of like the RCD next to the boards to provide circuits. I believe it to be at the origin only. Um, I'm going to say no on this one yeah. because that's basically put in a single point of failure. So you've got division of installation, which won't comply. <clears throat> and also AFDDs are not generally designed for use to do a whole installation from a single device anyway. So yeah, that had to be a trick question. Yeah. I mean, yep. you could so, put one on a single circuit outside the board, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But not, certainly not for the whole lot. No. So An AFDD so, is a single circuit device. Moving on, Matthew McClurg. Hello, sir, from the motherland in Scotland. Is the guidance in Scotland regarding high-rise residential buildings regarding the height, not 11 metres, not 18 metres? It, it may well be, hence that note in the regs. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah there's, there's a note, uh, note one. But um, it, this is the thing. That there's a difference between a high-rise and a high-risk residential building. Kind of the same thing, but you have to follow um, local legislation. But um, And the in-scope of the uh, the building safety bill is 18 meters um, or six above six stories yeah so, so I, think um, a, I think that's a put risk back on you no well you're responsible for the application of your engineering judgment and the mitigation of risk in everything we do we're just not really taught that in college possibly very well, well um what i'll but, say though is if you are working on, on a building that you are um concerned about whoever's managing the building with all the legislation that's coming out, ask them, is this as classified as an HRRB? Ask them. They, they should know and they should tell you because there's legislation that forces them to do that. And get it in writing. <laughs> get it in writing. So Matthew McDowell, the fire engineering is going to be an exciting thing to watch. And Dan will be doing a part six webinar at some point with us. Got you live. <laughs> um, how how Mr McDowell says how would the regulation for earth electrodes work when working in a block of flats well initially my thoughts are it won't however having done some recent lightning protection crossover training with Dane if there is a sufficient lightning protection course possibly you could make that part of a communal electrode system maybe yeah, you you can put one in for the whole block. Um, if you are going to do that, just think carefully about the size of conductor that's going to connect to it, because it's probably going to be a lot bigger than you yeah, think. And, and I'm going to I'm going to say something out because it's a really good course. Dane, do a fantastic 7671 62305 conversion course. It's one day. It's aimed at electricians. 
and it's aimed at all the bits in the book that we flick over because it's diagrams that we don't understand and it was mind-blowing and it made me realize how incompetent i was so thanks to the dane guys find them on instagram or social media really good course strongly recommend it i think it's, it's an essential course for electricians so hopefully that answers that mr mcdowell right next one uh betteridge again uh, escape routes with cables above ceiling clip or not from former webinars podcasts that firefighting activities involves taking the scene out so yeah we probably should have said this earlier on so the reason why i get annoyed and frustrated is yes you can't stick your above the ceiling and, and take responsibility for everybody else's stuff but you can discharge your duty of care you can make sure what you're doing is correct and in the regs in the guidance note in the note it says firefighting activities and papa watts was an ex-fireman now firefighting activities they don't they don't put a timer on their watch and say right red roll plugs have a performance of up to 30 minutes click let's all stop firefighting activities remember firefighting activities involves a hose and blasting high pressure water so these cables they need to not fall down like you saw in the images and entangle people and kill them so it's really important and there are british standards for fixings and pull testing which are now becoming more prevalent so keep that in mind so what, what i'll say on that though paul is that it if you, I've, I've seen a lot of um, installers do this. So they'll, they'll put um, cables above a ceiling and well, you, they'll assume that the ceiling's designed uh, to take premature collapse, but you have to be completely certain that that is the case. But first of all, you need to know what is the ceiling designed to? That's, that's the first thing, to know how you're gonna clip. I agree. Um, Mr. Theobald says, does that mean new domestic installs cannot be split load? 53132. Yeah. How do you interpret yes. that shall be considered? Say. I don't see how you can do it anymore. You can't. Yeah. I mean, this, the split load is all, or the dual RCD is already, a, it's just in the bin anyway, because there's you've got the multiple, too much leakage on the circuits, because you've got like four or five circuits on a single RCD. There is no way that's going to be under nine milliamps with all the electronic stuff. No. The division of installation has been in there for like 30 years. So, it's not really developing the installation if you've got two halves. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, when RCDs we, and all that on, gone in the bin. So, yeah, Chris, all these rigs are trying to do is get us to wake up. And I wrote an article about AC RCDs being thrown in the bin in 2015. Um, I was installing type A RCDs 20 years ago and I didn't even realize it at the time because I didn't have the knowledge. We need to wake up and be more aware and we need to consider more and more and more. I see in the wholesale the guys coming and go 2.5, 30 amp, blah, blah, 20 amp, whatever. General rules of thumb without consideration we're at that point now where the compatibility of technologies the leakage performance the requirements to meet directives the safety of people's homes is becoming more prevalent we need to think more and unfortunately for years with the death of a lot of apprenticeships our industry has been de-skilled or dumbed down and this is why we've been trying to say level up and the best way of doing it is five or six friends trying to share their knowledge and experience you can listen to us anything we're saying here doesn't mean we're right we're just engineers debating that's all we're doing. You can go and do your own thing. Mr. Betridge again has asked questions. God love him. And this is the last one I'm ask, answering of yours, Dave. Um, 6437, in every type of system this is stated, where is the effectiveness of the protective measure has been confirmed at a point located downstream of an RCD? The protection of the installation downstream from this point may be proven oh. by confirmation of continuity of the protective conductors. What is meant by this? Does anyone else answer this? <sighs> do we have to answer this? Can we just say, don't do it, please? That's probably the easiest answer. <laughs> okay, but we, we presume you didn't do it, but what it means is all you need to do is check that R2 is present. But why wouldn't you do a ZS? I mean, it's just... Uh... Yeah, let's just say, don't, don't come down here asking us about calculating because we firmly disagree with it, and you will find out why, and hopefully you'll agree with us soon. Um, I'm going to move on. Mr Cowley. How are you, sir? Um, Sheffield's nice. finest. Why is the test regarding RCD testing one times five, half times, regardless of type being downplayed, by a six monthly push button from quarterly, although you know, Nigel, that some of these devices require monthly? Mm. So, you know, we must have the right information and notices. Six yeah. monthly is just a, it's a generalized term like maximum of loops. It's, it's like an average of all the different manufacturers' figures and they have to try and fit within it. Um, why are the tests being dumbed down? Purely and simply, I blame the manufacturers and their... Can I say this out loud? Cheap crap, um, not being able to um, perform under reactants or capacitance issues with connected loads. 
Well, but then again, but is it the RCD or is it the test meter? Ooh, good one. The yeah. test meter is what cannot cope with a capacitive load. Don't forget. Um, you know, yeah, but it, what's happening is, is obviously it's chucking its current down and there's obviously lots of electronics in parallel that will have capacitors on board that could be affecting it. But Nigel, can we leave this to the RCD test? Yeah, because I think um, so. Nigel, just, just do what we said. You carry on doing what you're doing, mate. You're doing it well. End of. Yeah. Um, and I've told the IET they can swivel on this one because it's just yeah, not it's ridiculous. Right. Can we have the links mentioned in the webinar and chats available on the YouTube recording, please? Um, Eddie, chats, no. I am non-competent at even attempting that. Um, so I'm, I'm, apologies to everybody. Yes, if I knew how to do it, we'd be able to do it. But I genuinely don't know how to do it. And it's Dave's platform and Dave's ill. Um, so apologies. But the links, I promise you, I will put the links on the YouTube video and it will be up by midnight tonight. So I'll put them in as I'm typing in all the information. OK, so thank you for that, Eddie. You've reminded me. Um, and free docs. Yes, I'll answer that one as well. Um, Mr. Theobald, um, 722-41141. It just rolls off bullet point four. Now isn't limited to single phase installations. Thought question mark. I think it makes sense. Yeah, this is a change. We didn't actually cover this because it's such a minor thing. This is one of the four things you can use on a um, PME earthing facility. Um, this is the one which previously said in a single phase installation, and now it doesn't say in a single phase installation. And it's the one where you've got that magical device which disconnects within five seconds if the voltage between this and that varies. Is this the magical box that makes everything better, John? That's the one. Well, so now you can use them on three phase. Yeah. Oh, I didn't just do that, did I? Did I just show so, the uh, thing that makes things better? I would suggest it's probably been driven by uh, some manufacturers type things because they want to sell more things for three phase purposes as well as single phase. But the only change is that it's now they've just deleted the bit that said single phase. So, any so Mr. Durden, um, DNC to vote neutral current could be a huge issue with additional rods. We will we start fitting open devices as standard at origin if they ever comply. Ooh. I think the technology has lots of multiple uses, but as it stands, I'm firmly in with Paul. Product device interrogated, nationally understood, nationally recognized, uh, robust. Don't see that yet. I will I do not recommend any form of broken pen technology. Yeah. And I know if and, when a, yeah. if and when a standard if it's made for it and it is obviously done properly, well, look at it then. Mm. Yeah. Until then, yeah. Um, last again, Martin, do we think protected escape route could be equated with protected shaft from other regs? Um, yeah, it's exactly that. So a protected shaft is um, a shaft like a stairwell, uh, lift shaft, etc., where you have a fire resistance between the shaft and the next compartment. It's exactly the same as a protected escape route. Yeah, De Dexter has used BS81 for lifts. Um, Dexter, as you know, um, BS81 is or EN81 is being phased out. It's now ISO 81000 series of standards for lifts. So that's another change, more money, deep joy. Um, right, next one, Dexter again. Can we expect to see the EICRs at the emergency lighting webinar? I have to ask while Dan is here. Do you know what? It's it's actually done. And it has been like the furniture one for two years. It's actually sat on our drive. Um, we just need to do it, I think is the phrase. And one of the things I think we were going to talk about was getting an emergency lighting manufacturer onto the webinar with us. So I need to type an emergency lighting manufacturer because I think it'd be really good to bring someone in who's an expert who makes the products who can engage in debate and I want it to be really good. I don't want it to be just us winging it. Really good. So yes, I think is that one. Um, some RCDs say regular. What is regular? Ooh. Okay. Well, if the manufacturer's not telling you, I suggest you to find another manufacturer. Because quite frankly, if that's all they're going to tell you, then uh, doesn't give you much confidence in their products, does it? So I'm going to ask answer Ashley Bell's question. I can say firsthand colleges love to go by rule of thumb when it comes to domestic. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and I could comment and Dave is probably throwing something through his window at the moment. They do like to give you generic rule of thumbs because sometimes the teachers may not have the capability of teaching the entire syllabus. 
quality of teaching. <laughs> Fully endorsed by the ninja there. Um, and I, I'm not going to say anything more, but I have, I'm not going to say anything more, but best of luck in your learning journey, sir. Um, don't accept what you think to be wrong. Um, Gareth Cole, I'm an apprentice. Hello, sir. And was taught to calculate ZS on lights due to safety. So where and how can I safely take this ZS? This is the whole live working on lights now, isn't it? Yeah, this depends really on what kind of lights we're talking about. I mean, if it's in a domestic, there is no safety issue because you get those adapters that plug in the fixture. So it's no different than plugging into a socket outlet. Um, obviously, certain commercial types of lights, that may not be an option. But this whole thing about calculating it and not bothering to test it, bit of a fail. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm going to say I like it. So I'm chairman of the Electrical Safety Roundtable for Workplace Safety. And I, I absolutely recognise the need for live testing. And you must have the right control measures. And the first one will be always eliminate, reduce, isolate, control, our Eric PD. But there is a time when we need to do live. Anyone who says electricians don't, should never work live, well, you prove dead, which is potentially live working because it may not be dead. Yeah, and testing with control measures, the appropriate equipment, the right consideration, the knowledge of the utilization of the installation is perfectly fine if you know what you're doing. The trouble is, is we had testing inspection courses that used to be multiple, um, they used to be written exams, then they went multiple choice. The de skinning of the industry, Mr. Watts is probably going to shake his head in a minute or nod in agreement with me. Representing brother. Um, so I would suggest not calculating. And if you have sufficient confidence and knowledge to undertake the task, do it. Um, if you don't and you fancy learning, fancy coming to one of my railway stations on a Saturday and I will teach you testing. So there you go. It's an offer. Drive around the M25 to Ockenden and I will teach you live testing. So there you go. Any, any Saturday you want. Uh, Nigel Cowley, God bless you. That's his uh, question answered. Uh, Mr. Theobald, nearly there, chaps. With regards to open, do you think there's a risk of broken pen with single unpole switched, unswitched neutral RCBOs? Good question. No, I don't think so. Good question. Mm. Single pole solid neutral. It's a, it's a solid neutral bias said I wouldn't have expected the internals to fail, to be honest. Yeah, I think there's more debate on this because everything's going double pole, but you are right. There's I don't see much wrong with single pole. Double pole can be a negative sometimes in the wrong installations. But um, yeah, I, again, the open stuff, Chris, we're the wrong people to talk about because we have a view that doesn't go with the consensus of industry and manufacturing, unfortunately, because we want to re we want evidence, we want proof. Um, we are required anyway to understand the manufacturer's compliance and all that when we're selecting our products. Uh, Marco Sullivan, did I see somewhere saying AV cables need bonding? Quite possibly. Uh, if they are deemed extraneous coming into the installation, and they can be, then yes, maybe we might want to select um, our cables and our terminations to remove that requirement. Who knows? Um, but yeah, uh, Holly. Hello, Holly. She's on here. Do you hello. think the shorter tick list in the ESCR will lead to more drive-bys? Um, yes, because people will think that's it. But in the back of that, there is still the schedule of inspections. All that does is it breaks down what's on the main certificate in detail. I don't know why they put that in on the front because you've already done, you, they've done it to just on. simplify the form to the to the recipient. Yes, that, that 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 reduced checklist. All it says is you've done everything on the full checklist. Yes, under under section one, under section two, under section three. So you're just ticking instead of putting twenty ticks, you're putting one. You should still be doing those twenty checks. So Eddie has said calculated and test is best in your opinion, and you are, your opinion is valid, sir, as a professional engineer. So I respect that. And if people don't agree, I also respect that opinion as well. Uh, at the end of the day, one of the key things of competence is understanding our limitations. Um, Chris Theobald has said, for me, I would give a C2 and ACRCDs just like you. What would you code no RCD after Amendment 2? Ooh. Good question. Um, so for me, no RCD. Um, I don't I don't put it as potentially dangerous unless and I'll use my railway as an example. If a member of the public can touch it um, during normal operation or after vandalism, it will be RCD without question. It'll be C2. If it's anything else, 
no RCD because I have control of the installation. I have maintenance. I have 24 seven call out. I have the necessary skills and licensing and authorization. So for me, it's not a C2, but if it was a, if it was a, a light fitting on a stairwell at low level that could be vandalized or damaged and it wasn't an RCD, I'd expect a C2 on it. Simple as that, because that's common sense reduction of risk engineering judgment, in my opinion. I remember when RCDs were supplementary protection, I like to make other considerations before I go with the RCD. Is it in metallic conduit? Is it protected? Do I meet the requirements of chapter four? Then go for it. I still treat it as supplementary protection. That's my view because. Yeah, and things like certainly if it's like socket outlets, things, no RCD, it's got to be a C2 because people are careless with stuff they plug in. And whether yeah. it's outside yeah. or inside I mean, yeah. or any place, yeah, it should be there. Chris, if I was doing a rewire, I mean, I've rewired my house downstairs, all type A RCDs. Period. End of. Um, because I can be stupid, especially when I get older. Yeah. The, the only thing with 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 putting um, RCDs on sockets in industrial locations, which is why I don't agree with this blanket below thirty two amps, is mm -hmm. um, inverters, stuff like that. You know, you 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 are designed in leakage. There is designed in leakage, so you have to be very careful. You know, but that's in a controlled environment because it's an industrial location. You have a you have a duty holder under work regulations. You have procedures in place, like Paul's just said, you know. Uh, um, Mike from Alpha Tech has said he gave a C2 and NIC assessor marked him down. Then ring up the technical director, John O'Neill. I'll get, send you his phone number because um, I think that's a little bit harsh for an assessor. You should have been able to have an engineering debate and he should respect your engineering opinion. Um, yeah, absolutely. John Early. Hello, sir. I'm surprised to hear that AC RCDs were discontinued in Europe in the 80s. In the meanwhile, we've installed them in millions of homes. Yeah, because they really came to thunder in the 90s. So it's almost like they got rid of all their junk to England. What do you think will be the future coding for these? And when will it become a C2? Um, it's a C2 now, in my opinion. Engineering judgment, uh, duty care, all reasonable steps, defence regulation 29. Um, also, I think it's inevitable, as Paul said, by I'm going to take a punt and say the 19th edition amendment one, that type B will be heavily favoured. And if we can't fix this problem with the manufacturers and miniaturising this technology, I wouldn't be surprised if we go back to the good old fashioned EBADOS mechanical protection and we maybe uh, we keep that departure, that's, shall we say. I think it all depends on manufacturers. Manufacturers do steer this a lot. Uh, well, but, but good question, Mr. Early. One thing I will say, right, is, is that Lectrium, Siemens, um, Schneider, sorry, not Siemens, but Schneider, Electrium, Siemens, um, Wilex. Wilex and Crabtree. Some of their uh, badged type A CRCDs are actually type A. Yeah, fair enough. But um, the only way to find out is by asking them. So we have now finished 35 questions. So thank you for that. And I'm drawing the question into a close. Um, just before everybody disappears, any apprentices, if you message me on Instagram, we will arrange a special day for apprentices. And um, by the way, it's not a big switch room, it's a big earth farm, um, but we can take two or three at a time and it's on my time. So um, we'll arrange it. It will take probably two, three hours because I, I had someone the other day and they hadn't done it. So it takes as long as it takes. Um, but other than that, gents, final thoughts on Amendment 2, starting with Mr Ward. I think most of it is actually improvement. Yeah, there are a few bits and pieces which are a bit uh, suspect, but of course there are, there always is. But generally, yeah, most of what's been changed or added is actually worthwhile and deserves to be in there. Dan? Yeah, echoing what John said, really. Um, obviously, I'll pay attention to the fire bits. Uh, it's clarified some, but still a bit wishy-washy. Um, but I think it, it forces people, installer designers, to ask questions more to the clients. So, yeah, that's good. Mr. Skirm, sir. Um, <clears throat> there's a few bits I don't like. Uh, <coughs> dropping of the RCD testing being one of them. Um, I don't like the fact that we've only tested, we only test RCDs on the AC setting now. <coughs> um, I think that, that has come from the manufacturers because they were getting too many RCDs returned um, as not uh, functioning when they actually were functioning because they just weren't being tested properly. So um, just, just on that, Paul, so I've written to all the manufacturers and every manufacturer says different. So some will say test on AC only. 
but the majority have said test on AC setting and A. Mm. So this is where you need to, when you, when you, when you smell crap, call bullshit and do what you've always been doing. For me, it's t- test on type A, test on type uh, AC, period. Mm. End of. Yeah. And we'll go for that. Uh, labeling webinar. is a bit of a man, really. Is, but what worries me is that the information will be given to the clients. You know, this is why I've challenged Cert on. Hmm. So maybe they can be a solution. Who knows? But yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, one last question: Is Amendment Three due yet, Martin? Do it. Um, so Amendment Three, if we go based on hist- historical Amendment Three, they've already started on it. They've already started on it. They have started on it, but it, I believe it is scheduled for 2025, and then the 19th edition will be scheduled for 2028. So you're looking at three year cycles. I was told by somebody that they're actually working through, they just started, the first piece, piece of work that they've done on Amendment 3 is to go through all the comments that were put on the DPC for Amendment 1, for Amendment 2 rather, which weren't actually about the amendment. So if you commented something that was in the, in the DPC, which wasn't actually a change, but was something that had been in since, I don't know, it became the 18th um, or the 17th even, they're looking at those comments now with regard to taking those forward into the future editions, you know? Yeah, they are listening. I think they got so many comments, they just didn't give it a choice because 1,300 comments was great and well done to everyone who did because there are regs. And if the next edition they can get 2,000 comments, they need to really start listening more to what the industry wants and balance that whole technology and giving us the right information rather than potentially allowing manufacturers to steer the ship. Um, Mark's, even though he's ignored my last question, back to bonding AV, whose responsibility is it? Well, AV oh, is an ELV cable. It's under 7671. Is it extraneous? Find where was putting it or, in? Or remove the extraneous conductive part. And that can be done with the right choice of connectors or insulating or heat shrinking or whatever you need to do or putting it into a box. And don't forget, the AV installers that are supposed to meet this standard. Yeah, I'm not supposed to vote it. They must meet this standard. It's part yeah, of I think what he's trying to say is AV is lash it up. Um, well, yeah. And yeah, uh, more AV guys need to probably do 7671 training. Um, Dave, your final thoughts, which you can do with a nod or a head shake. Is it thumbs up, thumb down, or thumb in the middle? It's all right. Part, part six needs a redo. Don't like part six. I totally agree. And... On that bombshell, uh, ladies and gents, thank you very much. This has been one of the hardest four days of my life. Um, so if it's if you've taken something from away from it, great. Um, we have got other bits and bobs, podcasts, webinars. They'll come when they come because we want them to be decent. But thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dave, for hosting. And until the next one, peace. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. See you later. Right, I need to attend this now again, don't I? Uh, End. There's a button there. Bye, everyone. So, Dan, Um, you're probably wondering why the kittens are fighting the lightsabers. Yeah, why why are they? It's because it's fun. Fair enough. Fun, Dan. Good point. It's fun, Dan.